Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 329 of Spit and Chickens, presented by Pink Whitney. From our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family, what is up, everyone? The deadline has passed. We're officially in the playoff stretch on. Still got some good races going on. But first, let's say hi to the boys. We'll do it in order this week. Mike Grinelli, our producer. How are we doing, buddy? Uh, I'm doing fantastic. We actually kicked off a uh, new gaming campaign with Zip Chair Gaming last night on the Chicklets YouTube. So you can find that there over the next couple of weeks. And uh, we're launching a new, uh, we're doing a really cool merch uh, release this week. And I'll let Biz uh, talk a little bit more about that. Paul Biz Nasty, Bizonette. How are we doing, buddy? I'm doing wonderful. Got away from my phone this weekend quite a bit. Went for a hike. Oh, went so golfing good. with uh, Trevor Gretzky, Pasha. What? what? Trevor Gretzky. You went golfing? Yeah, I went golfing. Yes. That's right. That's hey, what I'm talking about, Biz. That's what I'm saying. And then Ash, his girlfriend, was there, and she's a professional golfer, or or at least t- t- on one of the tours, not L- LPGA, I believe, but she was there to help she's give nasty. me lessons. Buddy, I hit a I hit a seven iron like 170, two feet away. We ended up eagling the hole. We played on a team against Pasha and actually uh, Bo Bennett. Used to play in the NHL a little bit. I, I think he's yep. retiring now. Uh, ended up having 200 games. First rounder. He was, what was he, 20th overall originally? Was that he drafted the kid who by he the, played at Denver? Drafted, drafted to Pittsburgh. Drafted to Pittsburgh. That's where he went first. Played in St. Louis a little bit. But it was him and Pasha versus me and Trev, and we fucking dusted them. So uh, it, was, it was a great weekend. Uh, you mentioned that merch collab. So uh, I got a buddy. Uh, owns noble gentleman in canada and vancouver and uh, i reached out to him and i said hey i want to do this funky little uh collab with you and we ended up calling it unapologetically canadian is the name of the the clothing brand and we're releasing we're doing a very short release 100 sweaters you guys could see the logo here it's a mountie and you know probably out having a few pops on the weekend ended up getting a black guy shows up to work and and it just kind of goes with the theme of you know we're just unapologetically canadian and uh um artist by the name of randy perez is the one who drew the art and we ended up posting this to the front of the sweater of course uh with the chicklets logo on the arm so we're releasing these i believe on wednesday there's only 100 as i mentioned we just wanted to do a small drop so hopefully the people who get them love them and uh, they're great quality and i'm really excited about it Beats the shit out of Dudley Do Right as well. It's a good looking shirt. Thank you. What's du- what's du- what's D- Dudley Do Rider? He's the uh, the old cartoon. He was a Canadian Mountie. He was not the Looney Tunes, but was one of the uh, one of the other cartoons in like the sixties and seventies. He was legit a Mountie. So when I was at Universal Studios, they have you know the characters going around. I took a picture of him for, patting me down at Universal Studios. He's very reluctant to do it, but I talked him into it. Actually, um, <laughs> RA, I ended up watching uh, one of your recommendations. Oh. My octopus teacher. No, you didn't. I watched it front to back with. I recommend it and because you haven't watched it. We probably can't talk about it this episode, right? I don't know. Maybe at the end, if, if we need some time to kill, we can we can bring it up. But uh, I know you, I, you told me you enjoyed it very much, Biz, which I was glad to hear. Yeah, it was as advertised. It was a wonderful documentary. Just it was. It's like. The, the whole story is so unbelievable. It's like almost like it's fake, but watch it with so we can discuss it next, next podcast. It's not a long uh, commitment. I think it was about no. 90 minutes to two hours. Yeah, right around there. Yeah, around there. So, so I recommend it to anybody out there listening right now. It's a, a very sentimental story. Ah, there you go. And last but not least, the wit dog, Ryan Whitney. What's going on, my man? A couple things. Very funny that that just came up. I, I, I turned it on and I started it. And I, I was laughing at that guy so hard. Like he was just such a bizarre person that I really couldn't take it serious. I didn't dislike it, but I turned it off. So it all goes back to the sweater you're wearing, the new hoodie, unapologetically Canadian. Is that correct? Or unapologetically? Oh, you, you yeah. got right. it. You Crushed got the it. first time. Not a boy. I got one sent to me because Biz was describing them to me. He's like, I'll send you one. And I got it. And it, it's sick. But. I can't wear it. It, it. I. It's. I'm not Canadian. Like you only can wear this if you're Canadian, right? I. I in my opinion, I, I'm, I I'm an American. It, I'm not wearing unapologetically Canadian on my milk. So milk I. Body. I think we ended up making 104, so we could give a few out. Ra, have you gotten one? I have not, but sometimes I feel like an honorary Canadian when we go up to Canada, so I would have no problem. Well, with I in Halifax, you were more Canadian than Canadians when we went there. So <laughs> oh, let, let alone Muskoka. Wit. I saw it more as a gift to you so you you would feel comfortable wearing it. And I hope R.A. Actually, R.A., I'll send you this one if you want. 
and then, okay, and then listen, I'll make yeah. sure we get another one for, for somebody. Salvation listen, Army. listen. Yes. Listen, listen. I'll sell it to you out of the back of my trunk. <laughs> hey, <laughs> fell off the track. Listen, I wasn't finished. So, so I will take the sweatshirt because, like I said, I can't wear it. And it all stems back to my octopus's professor. Whoever writes me the best book report <laughs> has to be under 500 words book report. I will decide the winner and I'll send you my unapologetically Canadian. That is a, that is a a great idea because I can't watch the movie. The movie, (laughs) that guy is a creep. I don't think he's a creep. I think he's just a, no creep is not the right word. Creep's not the right word. That guy is the most bizarre human. Yeah. He's a bizarro. And then he gets in the water and I just, dude, I'll get, I, I might give it another go, but I want a book report. Okay, so RA, when I yeah. when I figured we were gonna eventually talk about it, I knew it was gonna be negative about that's this. such a lie. The, the, he still the, hasn't finished Ted Lasso either. Because because in wet in, 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 in some breath, I can agree that it, it's it's a I little bit to... it's a little bizarre that he became that obsessed with it. I like he basically would have signed up for their like things only fans if he could have. He was obsessed <laughs> with this fucking octopus. When I, I, when the thing might have had an only fans. <laughs> Like, is this the only is this the only guy she was fucking on the side or what? Show show me a seventh arm. (laughs) Hey, that listen, that that was the thing when we originally made the jokes of the octopus doing crazy things to him. And hey, honey, I'll be back. (laughs) It, it, I think he would have like he was in love with the octopus. Dude, he went to the back. Like I think what you have to be in a certain mood. I don't mean to the back. Stone back. I think it's just a certain mood because I put it on the first time and, and I didn't watch it through the first time I put oh, it on. I went, all right. Okay. And I went back to it and maybe I was just more open minded in a better mood, just whatever. And I went with the flow and I was like, holy shit. I mean, that guy went into the water 324 days, I think in a row. That water was like 50 degrees. He didn't have a wetsuit on. That's obsession. Like you said, Paul, he was obsessed with this animal. But like. If you ever had an interaction with a wild animal, I was a little kid, dude, and I was at a, a like a family outing, and a fucking clam, a squirrel came up to me, and I fed him my clam chowder. Squirrel in the woods, like, and it was like the weirdest fucking this thing. Is- like, I had a moment with a, with a squirrel, so I can't imagine being on the water and having a fucking octopus befriending you and touching you and shit. It's <laughs> Back it up. Thing. Back it up. He had a relationship with <laughs> squirrel. Dude, it was. Dude, squirrels don't Clam. usually come up to people in the woods. Clam oh fucking God. chowder. Yep. Dude, Clam. You, yep. Could, you could get any squirrel over, over to chill on your knee if you're waving peanut butter at him at a cookout in Charlestown. But, you, but this, this guy was with an octopus. This thing was like people friendly in the middle of the woods. It, it was enough that I remember it fucking 40 years later that I fed a squirrel. No, uh, not, not peanut butter with clam chowder. Clam chowder. Yeah, the night, it was the Knights of Columbus. It had fucking... pieces of an octopus in it, actually. <laughs> um, oh, I where was I? hungry watching oh. it. But I mean, listen, Wit, I completely agree with you. So I didn't cry during it already. You did say you got emotional. I did read a few tweets of other people who got emotional uh, during the documentary. What got me past that was just, you know, obviously this guy had been going through a, a very difficult time. And then I just thought it was bizarre that a guy who had the ability to be able to capture all of that on footage was the one that it ended up happening to. And without giving a... I, I guess if we're talking about it, we're kind of giving it away to a certain degree. The fact that when he scared it and he'd lost it, I don't know if you got to that part with. That's when I he, shut it down because oh, I was like, no, he didn't track it. And he was talking about learning how to track back in the desert. Right. And he, and he tied it back to his former job. What what I found odd was he he found a way to track it. And I think he said he did it in like six or seven days. Right, R.A.? So that's when I was like, eh, I'm like, are we right back to the median doc or, or, or mediums? Mediums? What do you call them? Medians? Yeah, mediums. Yeah. I, I don't think it was that level. I, I get what you're saying, oh, of all, of all the things to record that, you know, they, they captured this. But, I, you know, I, I'm sure there was probably some not artificialness, not artificiality, whatever the word is. But, yeah, somewhere it might have been a, a little bit. I hate to say rig, but yeah, a production like that, you're recording every day. There might be one or two things that might've been, okay, let's kind of play it this way. But either way, man, it, it just, it's just something you've never really seen before. And, you know, I know it's up for the best documentary against some like serious topic stuff that like, you know, social justice type things. And, and it's just about an octopus, but I hope it wins just because it's just like kind of a, a life affirming thing about nature, man. I just, it just puts you kind of in one of those moods, you know, I want and, a documentary uh, on your squirrel buddy. 
<laughs> the, I hope he's um, alive. Also, the informative things he he let us know about what octopuses can do and the way they think, and uh, watching the rehabilitation process that it went through. It, yeah. it was it was it was awesome. Very fascinating stuff, and also the reproductive uh, situation. I didn't know that. So all female octopuses die after giving birth. I that's think- that's. That's how it all goes. Yeah, that, that's the other thing. Two parts. A great nature doc if you're into into that type of stuff too. And how brilliant and how crazy an octopus is. I mean, it can sprout horns, it can cover itself in shells, all the all the little things it can do, man. It's it's an amazing creature. Like I say, it's almost like an alien when you're watching it. Um <laughs> I'm gonna stop ordering it for for appetizers now. I nah, uh, felt I a little it. guilty after that Calam- calamari cock over here. I, I took Ryder to his first NHL hockey game this weekend as well tilt between the capitals and the bruins at the garden ross the rink shrink yandel brought his son liam and i brought Ryder, and he was obsessed he knew when to get fired up because there's like i think three thousand people in the building and actually felt more more than that i think they're going to 25 percent capacity the guy said soon but he was cheering when the bruins scored the big hits and then he knew to kind of be upset and mad when washington scored <laughs> and it was just the the coolest experience for me as a dad it was awesome so we'll definitely be doing more of that it was great to be at a game dude it had been such a long time i was thinking about it. i was saying like you just miss seeing how good these guys are oh she scored a couple creche was sick it was oh we'll get into the game but the weekend was awesome so i didn't make it through octopus professor but i just crushed the bees with my son Actually, yeah, we're going to get to the Bruins caps in a minute. That was a very spirited affair on Sunday. Uh, Biz, I did get hungry for seafood. Uh, I'm seafood, seaweed. You ever eat seaweed, Biz? Yeah, I have had seaweed a few times. Uh, So 3,000 people in attendance. Did you get recognized uh, by a few Chicklets fans? Yeah, I took some pictures with the Chicklets fans. I was going to ask you, is Ryder like, what the f- No, he's not. He's not old enough. He's not. He's he's just kind of, he wouldn't know, I don't think. He didn't say, he doesn't really... He doesn't notice stuff like that. You just that. make him take the picture. He's just like, ah, ah, ah bro, let's go, bro. As he's clapping. <laughs> or I watch cars. I want to watch cars. So um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Some Chicklets fans actually two sat next to me. These guys were buckled. Great guys. They were crippled. I think they were from Danvers. They were brothers. The one, one brother ended up getting the boot. I think he was having a, he was having a blast at his other brother. Stayed. Three thousand people in attendance. He get tossed. His uh. other brother. Stayed. Well, like I don't know. I think he like kept having his mask off, and the guy enough was like, "Hey, dude, it's like fifth time you're out, bud." But the brother stayed, which I thought was hilarious. So I was like, "I'd stay too." So uh, yeah, we I, I saw a bunch of chicken today. There was actually a moment of um, like a feeling of. This is bizarre. We were walking to the bat to the bathroom at the intermission, or even before the intermission, and then they got all these like thin signs that come off the wall, you know, like to basically say like what's what spots there, what they sell, but they're video, and all of a sudden all of them were Pink Whitney, New Amps by New Amsterdam, so it's all pink, Pink Whitney. I'm like with Ryder, I'm like what the fuck, I'm at a Bruins game, and I'm like th- that's my like my drink or my name on this drink with my son, and I. It's just weird. So you're like, great. you're gonna get, you're gonna get to go to college because of that, bud. Uh, he was going to college <laughs> without that. Fuck. Oh, he was. Oh. Um. I want. <laughs> hey, wait. I wonder if. Uh, I wonder if the. I wonder if that squirrel that RA fed uh, clam chowder to is the same one that jumped out of uh, Yanz's buddy's car with the Jolly Rancher. <laughs> <laughs> no, because he didn't have a a collar on it. R because RA had a. He, it was his pet squirrel, <laughs> so he had a collar. He wouldn't have been just a naked squirrel. That's, That's true. Wildlife interactions. All right. We mentioned last week the nice weather's here. Baseball started. Playoff chases are on. There's a big horse race coming up, as well as some big movie awards this Sunday. So make sure you head over to your local liquor store today to find Pink Whitney in the new 375 milliliter Mickey size bottle that Biz always has right next to him. It's great for pregame, after party, and everything in between. So go to your local package store, get a new Mickey of Pink Whitney, and enjoy responsibly. Uh, we were talking about a little bit of lull uh, for hockey a second ago. Well, nobody had one longer than the Vancouver Canucks have this oh season. My God. They hadn't played since March 24th. Uh, the league wanted them to play Friday night. JT Miller came out and he said, quote, it's going to be dangerous to a lot of players for the team to play so soon. I, I think that was kind of like a salvo uh, to the league. Like, hey, if you make us play, we're going to file this with the a grievance with the union. I, I could be overstating that, but that's the impression I got because the league did push the game two days later. Uh, they played Toronto. We're losing two nothing. They were the biggest underdog in several years. I think Toronto was like a three sixty favorite. Come back from a two nothing deficit, one three two. 
Uh, Hopi was out of his mind. This is the Hopi I think Vancouver thought they would get when they signed him at the beginning of the year. But the end of the game, Biz, I sent the clip to you guys of Vancouver, the way they were celebrating. It was just like, you wonder if this is a galvanizing moment for them. I mean, they're 10 points back, but they have four games in hand on Montreal. I wouldn't say they're dead quite yet, Biz. Well, that's the thing, R.A., and, and I kind of wrote them off as far as playoffs is concerned, but, you know, given the fact that they do have these game in hands, they can cut, catch Montreal, and they, Montreal has been so inconsistent. And, you know, given the fact that Vancouver is being, being put even more behind the eight ball with all this condensed schedule bullshit and playing that many games in 30 days, if this group still thinks they're going to make playoffs, like, I guess I'm okay with him bitching, but at – in the grand scheme of things, it's like, well, fuck, I, I you know, the, the whole team caught COVID. They're trying to rally this thing in time. So playoffs can start at a certain point and they're probably looking at it. Like maybe Vancouver is not going to make playoffs. Now, I guess one other solution would have been if it gets to the point later down the line, if there's some games that they could back up against non playoff teams, like let's say in Ottawa, for instance, if they even still have any games against them, maybe backload them. So those games are happening a few games into the playoff season, if in fact that they don't, if they don't make it, but you know, overall, as you mentioned, that's a, that's a big win to potentially spark plug this team. And, and all of a sudden you're, you have so many games in the small amount of time. If you get on a hot streak, all of you, all of a sudden they're in the playoff picture. So with, as a guy who played 20 minutes a night, I didn't, I could only imagine that you were probably feeling the same way that he was, where this is ridiculous, especially not given a lot of practice time in order to get back your game legs to go into this type of run. I respected the hell out of him saying it because you started hearing about how little practice time they had. And my mind races back to any time you did get the flu during the season or you just got sick. You skated that first and even second time and you were nothing. Your legs were jello. Your hands were trash. You can't breathe. So not only is that one player in a team of 20, right? All these guys that were battling are on the ice and Miller's out there and all the boys I'm sure are are talking like, I, I, I cannot play an NHL game right now. We we will get guys could get hurt. You know, it's, it's, that's not fair. So he comes out and says it makes total sense. At least having played, I couldn't agree more with him. And then the league did take notice. So you got to respect like the, the players speaking up and having some power there. That's interesting thought already. I didn't think that where they were setting them up to just maybe say, hey, listen, we're telling you to do this. Or we'll, what could they do? Would you say file suit? I mean, it would not a suit, but I, I would think, I'm, and I'm totally speculating, you guys were in the union, uh, file a grievance like with, against the league saying like, you know, they're basically making us go to work when we're not, we're, si- we're still sick or we haven't had time to recover. And like I said, I think the fact that the league did move these games ahead kind of spoke volumes. I, I think it was like, I don't even know if it was implied and I'm not putting words in Miller's mouth. I don't know if that was his intention, but that's just the way I read it. Like, okay, you guys got to fucking change this. We're not ready to play. The yeah. league heard him and moved it. And it could have gotten ugly if the league didn't do that. Again. I, my, my, my what, I, what I think the most ridiculous thing was with is, is it just so happened that some of the guys, I don't think it was the full team, but some guys coming off that they wouldn't have even had a practice day before their Friday game against the Edmonton Oilers where it's like okay yeah. like you're setting them up for failure so I mean they I mean they still had a quick turnaround and still were able to must out a, a, a gutsy win against uh against Toronto so who knows no. what the future holds for them getting what's that the, them winning was ridiculous and I actually as as the whole thing was going on and the team was more guys were getting COVID and it was really you understanding it's going to be a longer and longer break. I was like the first game back, I am pounding whoever oh, I'm playing against. <laughs> I and don't then, even gamble. And I was thinking of that. I, I was like, this is like a lock and, and sure as shit. I forgot. I totally forgot. And if I'd seen it was minus three, six, six, I was saying I, I would have put something on the goal line, but wow. You know, some people got hammered on that bet last night or Saturday. Time. Hey, so uh, RA live bet when the Leafs ended up going up two nothing. What do you think the line turned to? Man, Could that Vancouver go as big been, as five hundred? Probably, probably higher. I mean, Vancouver was anywhere from three sixty to three eighty before the game. So if they got a two goal lead. I would say you could probably could find Vancouver plus seven hundred to win the game outright. So at some places, damn. Damn, gutsy win! I'm excited to see how the hey and and uh, are we sticking with the North theme based on oh, how we on, started hold with that on. topic? Sorry, sorry, guys. One more thing in that game, buddy. Um, there was a suspension, right? Edler, yes, Edler, Ed, and Alex Edler got yes, two games. Yes, Alex Edler, and you look at that hit, and very 
first of all, Zach Hyman, how important is he? Like, Sheldon Keefe wishes he could play the guy on every single line. He's just every, he's such a good player that anyone who plays with him becomes better automatically. You're going to have the puck more. You're going to be in the offensive zone more. So to lose him and you don't know what's going on, it sounds like it won't be super serious, but you heard that before. You hear that all the time. Hey, it's nothing. Next thing you know, it's three months. So hopefully he's okay. But the hit, luckily his, his leg, his foot wasn't completely planted. Whereas if there was, there wasn't all of his weight wasn't on it. So it was able to move back and maybe really save him from having a torn ACL and a completely blown out knee. Very dangerous hit. Surprised to see that. From Alex Adler for sure. Yeah. It's uh yeah, you can't be losing Hyman. No. <clears throat> yeah, that hit what definitely was a surprise to see. Uh, also, El- 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 Elias Pettersson, he might be out for the rest of the year. He's been dealing with an injury. So, you know, if Vancouver is going to cr- climb back and it, it's going to be a little bit tougher without him. I-, I had to go run and get a cord. Did you guys mention the save by Holtby, the windmill kick save, bicycle kick, no, whatever you want to describe it? We saved it. it for you. Huh? We saved You're the goalie it guy, so we wanted so, you to tee that save up, bud. Like, when I saw it, I, I literally tweeted, did he just do that? And I had to wait for the replay, and, and he did. I mean, he made the poke check, and the thing was going to go in. he come up. I mean, what do you call it? A bicycle, a wagon wheel. Uh, there was 17 different names to describe it. I know we've had a ton of great saves, but Holpe was unreal last night. You got to, like I said, you got to figure that's going to give him confidence and, in turn, maybe give the team some confidence, too. Uh, one other note, too, the Canucks actually closed off practice and they, they pissed off the Pro Hockey Writers Association because I guess it's actually in the CBA that reporters are supposed to go to practice. So the reporters were pissed off about it. They, you know, they put out a statement, but I guess the team didn't want them reporting guys were leaving practice early because they're probably likely to do to COVID. So they they basically banned them. But it was only a one practice thing. It kind of blew over. But. I don't know, just noteworthy that yeah. team keeping media out. Uh, also in the division biz, uh, Winnipeg uh, signed uh, Lowry to a five-year, $3.25 million extension. He's a nice piece of that team. He brings some grit, some sandpaper, like his old man used to do back in the day. And uh, Nate Thompson, we want to give congrats to him. He played his 800th NHL game, the third most among Alaskans uh, after Scott Gomez and Brandon Dubinsky. So congrats to Nate, our old pal. I'm drawing uh, a blank right now. Who's the guy the, the Bruins picked up at the deadline last year for Minnie? Was it Minnie? The centerman. Uh, Joe oh, came, Johansson in 19? No, he came, back, he came back home. He's from there. I thought he came over from Minnie. Charlie There's, Coyle. Charlie Coyle. He kind of oh. reminds me, maybe, maybe not as much offensive upside, but very similar type player where very good, very light upon, uh, you know, play some heavy minutes for, for Winnipeg. And I think that that's a great deal. I believe he's playing third line center there right now, correct? Yeah, and, and he's an animal. Like he's, yes. he brings a little different aspect like than, than Coyle. Yeah. And Coyle makes a lot more. Coyle's going to make a lot more than him, I believe. Correct. What was it? Three, the average was three and a half per year. All right. Uh, Three and a quarter times five years for Adam Lowry. You like that deal. Big guy can move playoff type player in people's faces. I, I, I know he played in the WHL. I don't know where, but yeah, he'll, he'll be somebody who makes them difficult to play against. And when you get down off that top line, that's exactly what Winnipeg needs. It's what makes them good. Um, this happened actually Monday night after we recorded Milan Lucic played in his 1000th game uh, and he ended up fighting Danny Sabra. That was a great fight, man. It was, it was pretty appropriate that Lucic would fight in his 1000th game. He ate a couple lefts from Sabra first. Then he, he fed him a couple pretty damn good fight biz. Uh, what was your take on it? Well, I played with Sabs, eh? and, and I've talked about him many a times, probably one of the sneakiest he's a, I would consider him a light heavyweight based just on his size, but he, he'll go toe-to-toe with heavyweights. I thought it was in very fitting Luch fashion to get him to tilt right off the get-go there. Uh, what, a, what an unbelievable career. And I know that uh, I'm sure it, it, it was you know probably a pretty emotional and, and, and heavy on him during his time in Edmonton, having that big contract and maybe things not going a, a, as well as he'd hoped. But I think he's found a great home in Calgary, and it seems like that group really uh, – really embraced him when he came over and he's fit in a lot better there. So what an unbelievable career and uh, to, to many, many more And I think we were talking, uh, we were talking to, uh, with, uh, about him with pasta. Were we not about how he can slam beers? Yeah. Oh, boom. There you go. You just mentioned our guest. We had mentioned two guests. We got Boston Bruins superstar, David Pasta. We were lucky to get him the other night and he did score after and we couldn't really say he had a chip, a chicklets bump because we hadn't mentioned he was on, but a little chicklets bump for him. And we also have a uh, well-traveled veteran, Martin St. Pierre. This guy played all over the world. He's got some great stories. We're going to get to him a little later as well. Uh, one of the note on Calgary too, is uh, they traded Dave Riddick to um, Toronto at the deadline. Well, they were going to play Toronto the next game. So the, he rode on the plane ride with him. So they traded him to Toronto. He was a leaf and they, he rode 
to Toronto with all the all well, his former teammates. I guess they were busting his chops in the plane and stuff. I asked Biz. I was wondering, do you think he would have done that if it wasn't a goalie? Do you think it would have been a little different if you were yeah, battling? I, yeah, I think I think the goaltending position is a little bit different. Definitely. I, mean, I could be heard, way off base. I really could. But I was like, I don't know if like he the next night he'd be like in the corner. I could f- possibly fight you like we're battling. Whereas a goalie, it just there, there isn't that to, to hang out with him that extra day when you're going against him the next night. Oh, no, if anything, you want to be nice to him. Maybe give him a let one in for me. Let a few in for the boys. Fuck. Take Contract care of us. Year, please help yeah. me. Do I get a per diem pack? Nope. Okay. Yeah. I'll go fuck myself. Um, nope. COVID, COVID probably had a factor on that too. You know, it's under normal circumstances. It might not happen, but it was just one, easy to let one the One thing fly. that yes, you didn't but, know yes, very though, true. is the fact that they made him ride underneath though. That's the only, that's the only <laughs> downside. They put him with, with, with all the With bags. the dogs? With the no, dogs, with the yeah. octopus. When you, when you ship those around. Like major the RA's teacher. Yeah, and, put them in see, the stick bag. Too, he had a little interactions with his old teammates. He bumped Goudreau uh, going to the net once, and uh, Matty Kachek gave him a little spray. So it was no, no love lost the, the first Holy game against each other. fucking tummy sticks. Settle Good down. Shit. No, no, not tummy sticks at all. We'll get to your tummy sticks a little later. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh-oh. I know. Wow, yeah. a picture yeah. that yeah. Um, appears out of nowhere. Bring it up now, R.A. So okay. R.A. Sent- R.A. sends me this picture, and it's uh, you got it from Getty Images, I would imagine. Well, and it, yeah, it was a story in The Athletic about about you and Jansen texting during the game with, um, what was it? Jeremy um, Rutherford. Jeremy Rutherford, yep. Yeah, so we did something uh, when the Coyotes ended up uh, spanking the St. Louis Blues, but there was a picture of me <laughs> laughing as Cam Jansen's looking at me at center ice before a game, and he's clearly saying something. Now, Wit, you hit the nail on the head. I'm pretty sure we fought our first shift in that game. But the only other possible uh, explanation for other than lining up a fight would have been Jansen asking me where I'm going in Old Town after the game. That's the, that's the and then I and then I probably gave him a quick answer and the rest is history. And I guarantee you, at least one of us were a healthy scratch that night. But more than likely, you just said we, you fought. <laughs> no, but I but I said more than likely because in I think we fought two or three times in the first period on on home ice here at Gila River Arena. So, and, and I, I specifically remember that game because I think he came up and like might even sprayed me a little bit and said, we going. We never had this animosity towards yeah. one another, especially even before we fought. Janny was always one of those guys like, hey, we getting it done? Like came up and warm up and usually asked you. He no, I feel like I feel like he'd be like, "Hey, Biz, what's up, bud? I'm gonna punch your fucking head in." Hey, hey. <laughs> like, like legit, like he's like laughing, but he's like, "We're going. I love you, but I'm gonna kill you." He yeah, also must have so. been a guy, Biz, for you that that's not the funnest one leading up. Like you know, you're going him right away. You know he's tough as shit. It's gonna be a, he's gonna be throwing him. It's not gonna be a hug match, a hug fest. No, I actually enjoyed it because I knew that he always wanted to get his out, done out of the way, and so did I. I didn't want to skate around yeah. all first period wondering when the time was going to be. I'd be fumble fucking the puck. I'd be in the back <laughs> of my net. I'd be like, fuck. You know, I'll be fighting something, that's for sure. But, no, he liked to get it out of the way. He, he liked to exchange and you know you'd get you know get the fi- fans riled up. You go to the box, and, and that, that was it. That was the Cam Jansen show, and I loved it. I loved being a part of it. Yeah, it's a great picture. You should track it down and get a copy. It'd be nice. It's nice one to have so, on the wall. So I would say no tummy sticks on the uh, okay. on uh, on what, what what would you call that? If you fight, Photograph. if if you if you're trying to smash someone's nose through their their orbital, like twenty minutes after that picture, you can't call it tummy sticks. No, I'm backing. I'm okay. backing my boy here. All right, we have a ruling. No, I was tummy actually sticks. giving him. Uh, what do you think, um, Grinelli? I was giving him hairline tips at, at center ice. There, I don't know <laughs> if you saw how thin Cam was in that picture up top. I'm sure he's not going to like that comment. That's either. a late low blow, Cam. Just nice. at the final whistle of the third period <laughs> when the season's over, you'll remember all summer though and get he'll him. Get, he'll get me in the tunnel. That's the type of guy Cam is. <laughs> I think it's kind of tummy sticks. Can you guys believe? Oh, no, this is Grinelli believe- coming back at me because I chirped his hair and I jumped on your bandwagon of that. It was, it was a, I'd say it was a six and a half out of 10. Yo, Grinelli texted me at like 10 o'clock at night this weekend. And he's like, dude, I'm with a bunch of people who say my hair is just as good as Bieber's. It's not just me. I'm like, whoa. I'm like thinking about it much. Am I in your head much? Rent free, baby. Bieber. <laughs> Fucking free. Brunelli, what are you looking down for? What do, what do you what do you got to say? I didn't I didn't I didn't know I texted you that. Oh ah! damn, I'm I, I must have had a few too many of those pink Whitney nips. Since we mentioned Bieber, that new Peaches track, you gotta be all about that one, Wit. 
I got my peaches down in Georgia. Yeah, that's it. Dude. Everyone's nope. saying we have People similar have hair. Not me, just them. <laughs> oh, man. I was cooked. Oh, shit. I uh, love it. I love when you're cooked sending in messages about, this, about the, the, the hair. Um, Salad. What, what else were we just talking about that was on my mind? Oh, Ari had a pet squirrel. <laughs> no, I didn't have a pet squirrel. That's No, it was a random squirrel on nature, in the woods. That's what, That was my connection oh, to it. I didn't have I a pet squirrel. It. I had a pet this snake. This is the best but... Monday. I'm so <laughs> fired up right now to be like, that just got me going. My co-host had a squirrel. That he fed Cheerios we should, we and clam chowder, chowder too. We should compete for best documentary. Ra and a squirrel. We'll get uh, we'll get the film. That could crew. be we'll get Pasha finest yeah. work. My father remembers too. Um, uh, who were we talking about? Oh, and uh, and that going back to that Sabrin fight. I believe he cut Luch pretty good there. Yeah, he got him good. Yeah. He, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, he got him. He I cut him Leak with one of those left. I didn't see the highlights of that. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Luch, mentioned Luch again, Wade, because he, I mean, Biz, he was so huge in Boston. Like, they were so bad, and he was one of those guys who, like, reestablished the Bruins as, like, a formidable franchise in the NHL, helped them win a Stanley Cup. So I'm always going to root for the guy. I don't care. You know, I know a lot of people around the league, I should say, fans can't stand the guy, but I love what he does. He does. He proves that intimidation and physicality always matter in, in sport and in hockey, and he's still doing it fucking, yeah. what? I would say if, if every fan base hates your guts in Lucha's position, he's doing his job to a T. So uh, keep doing your thing, buddy. Keep slamming beers and, and keep collecting paychecks. There you go. Hey, um, um, sorry, all right, quickly. Yeah. Just a, another note in the North, because I figured we're wrapping that up because we got to talk about Patrick Marlowe and breaking Gordie Howe's record. But the Flames, I didn't realize. The Flames and the Senators, are they're playing, you know, they're going to be playing right now. You'll be listening to this tomorrow. Six and two this year, Ottawa is against the Flames. The Flames can look at not making the playoffs because of how much the Senators have dominated them this year. So I couldn't believe seeing that. And, and it's just interesting and also shows that Ottawa is way better, way better than I gave them credit for early in the year and that most hockey fans said about them. <laughs> I told you they'd be competitive all year. No surprises here. They've been actually a really fun team to watch, man. Of course, I bet them a lot, but they've been good stuff. All right, let's circle back with... You talked about Ryder's first game, that Boston-Washington game. This is These are two teams, man, that really didn't have a huge history of animosity. But this year, it's been ugly. Of course, Wilson knocked out Carlo with that hit earlier before. Uh, then he – well, the hit on Corrali was – a lot of people were complaining about it. It was incidental. Corrali was falling. Wilson was going to hit him. I had no issue with it. But uh, then you had Ove- Ovechkin hit McAvoy up pretty high. The Hathaway hit on Tenorti would bloody them, get five-minute majors. This has turned into a, a nasty rivalry. And I think a lot of people are champing at the bit to see this in the playoffs with. Oh, I think it would be a great series. Um, Tuca was awesome. He gave up three, but he made some huge saves. Bunch of breakaway saves. They, they, the Bruins didn't really come out that strong. And then, you know, they're still leading. And, oh, and Halsey. I love, I love how he's playing with Boston. He's got two goals already. He got an assist yesterday, grinding it out in the corner. And then it, it, gets, it gets over to Krejci, who the patience, the toe drag, just yeah, shelf. That was the net. We were sitting right behind. What a goal. Um, but you watch how they go head to head. And it's funny because I look at the Bruins and you're like, I don't know. Does this team have it? They make a bunch of good deals. Don Sweeney really gets not enough credit. I would say when, when, when you're talking about like improving the team mid season, Halsey looks good. The defenseman, Mike Riley is a smart player. I said this on the episode before he even played a game. I think it was the night of the deadline. He looks like to fit right in. He's leading the team in ice time. And then you think, not only do they, they get Grizzlick back, he's playing next game. They get Kevin Miller back, and his injury that he's out right now is not the knee. He does – it's tough staying healthy the way he plays, but they'll get him back. And then Carlo, I don't know the uh, – what is the, the timeline for Carlo? It's, there's nothing definite right now. He's not traveling with him right now. So but That's a lot of additions, so that, though. That's, that's, I, I mean, know. That's, that's I know. going to bolster then, the lineup just like it did at the deadline. Exactly. So I'm drawing a complete blank. It's really embarrassing. Oh, Lazar. Lazar. Lazar yeah. I couldn't think of his name. He, you know, getting that fourth line, him him and Wags look good together. And and I think Corrali had a good game. He's had kind of a year where you might have ex- expected a little bit more. But the Bruins, they got their swagger back. And Washington's going to be right there. They had just played the day before and toasted Philly. Ovechkin had two more. So maybe, you know, the travel and the Bruins on a little bit of a streak uh, ended up getting the best one. But an awesome, entertaining game. Great first well, game for Ryder. Jesus. I'll, I'll throw it to you quickly, R.A. You texted me right away and you said, man, the Bruins, since the additions, just look completely re- rejuvenated. And like, I think it also sends a message to the top end guys where – 
you know, they're you know games where if, if they if they're unable to produce the offense, at least they're gonna you know not looking at fucking losing. They could have you know Halsey's line step up or 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 even those deeper lines that they added to as well. Yeah, I mean four and zero since the deadline. They're obviously a much better team. Second line is better. Lazar in the fourth line has totally rejuvenated it. And like what, what you said about Riley, I said when they got him, people are gonna be surprised. He wasn't the big sexy name, but he's been great for the B so far. Also, Tuka's 300th win. He's the fourth Finn to ever hit that number. And, dude, how about Marshawn, man? I mean, this is a guy who's going to have his number on the rafters. Uh, fourth Bruin ever with 10 or more 20-goal seasons, and he's done it in eight consecutive. He's the seventh winger ever to reach 50 shorthanded points. And how about this? Shorthanded goals since 2017. Bergeron, Bergeron and Marshawn have combined for 18. That's more than the Capitals, Wild, Kings, Maple Leafs, and Flyers as total teams. And this one's from Dmitry Filipovich, who always has great shit on Twitter. Bergeron and Marchand have played 57 minutes and 10 seconds, four on five together this season, and the score is tied six to six. That's fucking insane when you think about it. A man short and the fucking game is tied when you, when you take it like that. So, uh, you know, yeah, whatever. I don't stroke the Bruins off as much as, as I used to, so it's nice to actually do it and mean it for once. What's up, Mike? Mikey, I think this is one that can get the Instagram humming a little bit. Let's get up there that I'll say right now that Brad Marchand and his trajectory and where he at, where he's trajectory, at. Trajectory, that's my word. Is heading right towards the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think he's already there. You think, think he's, he's already in the Hall of Fame? Oh, yeah. Stanley Cup, uh, Olympics. Uh, yeah, I think that he's uh, as a winger for the okay, amount Okay, of- so maybe that's not a crazy statement, and I look like a complete idiot. But still, <laughs> there'll be people. I guarantee you in that dumbass comment section full of complete losers, I guarantee you... <laughs> That there's a lot of people that strongly disagree with me. Okay, so you were at the game. With one other thing, I wanted to ask you about: Did you notice the goal where Ovechkin was complaining afterward at the fa- fact that he thought that Tom Wilson was hit late in the offensive zone? Ends up going back the other way when they played that. Uh, I think it was a, a beautiful three. It was a three on two, was it not? Where they snapped it around a little bit. I think it was past the back door to Bergeron. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Was was Ovi yelling about? He thought that the Wilson that should have been a penalty. The hit on Wilson on the NBC broadcast when I was watching the game already, like he was losing his mind to the point where even after the period had ended, he was having a one-on-one with the official. Now, what I thought was interesting is I, you could tell Wilson, but the game was, was very physical from the beginning. So I don't want to credit to that. Do I think that Wilson should have been penalized for that hit on, it was Corrali he got, right? Mm -hmm. I just felt that he was being a little bit more like, I'm going to fucking get somebody back after that came off of his check in order to make the play. I think as a Bruins fan, that's probably why you saw so many uh, people online bitching. And I mean, Haggerty was one of them, but no way should that have faced any type of uh, supplementary supplement. Didn't Cassidy even say it? Yeah. Cassidy even said it was incidental to him. Yeah. When the coach coach says it. Yeah. I said, I tweeted, someone's like, Oh, what's he going to get for that? I'm like, nothing. That's no supplementary discipline at all. It's like, what's that word? I, I I was trying to say supp- supplementary. Bingo. Yes. Hey, fuck yeah. nice. hey boys. Bye. What did I get earlier? What word did I get earlier in this show? Trajectory <laughs> when you stole nope, it for me. Nope, nope. Earlier. Oh. Earlier. I had a good one. Damn. Hey, oh, good unapologetically. Boy. No. Oh, yeah. Unapologetically. <laughs> and I had to ask one. if it was right. I should I ruined it by doing um, that. So but the one hit, a pet squirrel. So the one hit we probably should talk about is Tenorti, who's been tape taking an absolute beating Oof. this year. Who he got hit from uh, from Tanev for That's an bad ugly luck out there. And I will say though, watching the replay, I, I I think at that point in the game and given the result, might as well five three at that point. Ten minutes left, get him out. I don't think that he's going to have any supplementary discipline. Yeah, no. Um, I- Ding, ding. What do you think, R.A.? No, I don't either. No. Um, you know, it was a Borden, Borden hit. It was ugly. It was interesting. The ref right there didn't call it. The other ref at, at center ice called it. But, yeah, I think that'll be like you got the gate. You, you're, you're thrown out of the game. I think that's going to serve as his punishment. You know, I've seen worse boardings. But, I don't when a guy's back's facing you, shouldn't, you shouldn't really thrust that much force. And, I mean, look at, look at the results. I mean, Tonori was a bloody mess afterwards. And I'm sure he was spitting chiclets, if not a broken nose there. So, yeah, I don't see supplementary discipline. I think he, he got his punishment during the game. And the two biggest factors being, you could see his right skate. He ends up stopping. You could see the snow come up. Just And, and where, you know when a guy starts lifting his head up, he's kind of being like, oh, you could tell he realized split second late and, and you know, he got punished for it. And I think the, the rest is history. But overall, probably one of the most competitive games I've watched all season long. 
Yeah. Very, very, very trippy. And one last note on the Bruins, you can still find them at 16 to one in several shops out there, including the Boston sports book. So probably not a bad little investment. There's a couple other teams in the old division. We got to talk about a couple of New York teams, the Rangers, man, they're the hottest team in hockey, uh, four in a row over New Jersey this week. They outscored them 18 to six. Um, I the only unfortunate thing for the Rangers is the Bruins are right ahead of them. Otherwise, I don't, they'd probably be in a playoff spot right now. Uh, there was some news with the Rangers regarding Tony D'Angelo. Uh, he was offered a contract termination uh, uh, right before the deadline. Uh, he didn't want to do it. Montreal is very interested in him, so he's going to be bought out this summer. He's still going to get paid, and then he's, he'll be free to sign with anybody he wants to this summer. But, yeah, he could have he could have uh, taken a termination and played this year, but he opted to just take the rest of the year off. Uh, but we got to talk about Artemi Panarin, man. This kid, MVP candidate. The Rangers are an absolutely different team with him in the lineup. But, Biz, are they going to get a playoff spot? Are they going to stay hot enough to catch the Bees? Well, I mean, as as much as we've been pumping the Bees' tires, they're only four points back as we speak. And 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 the Rangers were the team I picked to win the division, mind you. So you're welcome. They were just uh, clicking a little bit late. And for Panarin to come back after his time away to just – come back and do this. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty impressive. And I mean, we, we, we mentioned about a month ago when Zabenajad went on that insane run where he had like eight points and what do you have or six points in, in back-to-back games or something or at against least the ranges. The, yeah. Or against the, the flyers, you mean, flyers, Fly, sorry. Yeah, flyers. Sorry, with, with, uh, the paper. with no coaches on the bench, but uh, yeah, man, they've been a very impressive. Oh, and, and I think that, I think it would be fair. And we talked about him a couple episodes ago, Adam Fox. Like, I think that, to a certain degree, he's entered his name in the Norris conversation. He's been incredible. I think he's second in points right now, lugging a ton of ice. And and, and I, know, I know we haven't had a chance to uh, pump him up, especially earlier in the season when the team wasn't doing well. But uh, that's definitely a big reason as to the run that they've been on lately. I, I, Panarin, second star of the week, 10 points in the four games. He, last year, it was like, oh, my God, there's another level for this guy. 90 points, right? Or was he, was he on pace? I don't know exactly. Maybe I'm messing that up. But it was like MVP discussions. And then this year starts, and he looks great. But then whatever happens with Russia and that political stuff and him missing time, for him to come back like this, it really is shocking. Maybe I'm an idiot for being shocked at this point and that when he plays, he's a he's a – He's a multi-point per game guy, it seems like. When he's on, it's two, three points. And he's got an amazing ability to get open. That's what I always notice. He'll be on a two-on-one. The other guy will be carrying the puck. He knows when to go to the net. He knows when to just stop up and just let that D-man continue to slide back. He opens up for one time. He scored a goal like that recently. So makes that team so much better. And now you don't hear everyone, fire Quinn, fire Quinn. I, I don't understand why anyone would say that. This team looks, they look improved. And you can't. I think people expected stuff out of the Rangers this year going back. And what they were thinking in their head was the run that they went on for about a month before the season was canceled because of COVID. It might have been even a two month stretch. That was the team. They're like, oh, my God, in the playoffs at the time when the season was delayed. But then they came back and you saw them in the bubble and they weren't great and they're young. And then the expectations were just too high. So now you're seeing a team who started off slow and dealt with how young guys are and dealt with Panarin being out, and now they're catching their strides similar to the way they did whatever it is now, a year ago, two years ago. Fuck, my brain's broken and trying to think what season that was. But he changes the entire team, and every night watching him, he's, he's probably top five most electrifying players to see if you're watching NHL games. How's that? 95, 95 points in 69 games last year, Wit. Look at you, Wit. Oh, my goodness. 69, ga- 69 games. Nice. Someone's nice. got to say it, right? Also, too, the Rangers with a major fucking Twitter dunk on the Devils, too. Back in February, uh, the Devils tweeted. Remember that? That uh, was a story. It was a, a clip from a guy skating on the ri- uh, river in Europe, and he did a wicked face plant into yes. the ice. It was like yep. for a frozen river. Well, the Devils tweeted that with the Rangers logo on it. And it says, oh, you're doing amazing, sweetie. So the, the Rangers quote tweeted it Sunday, said, hey, thanks, you too. After they swept them four games in a row, it was like, <laughs> wicked dunk. But then the Rangers tried to come back and said, oh, so, wow, someone let you have personality. Finally, it's like, buddy, you already you take the L. You, you lost this round. Just just walk away. But it's oh, fun. Oh, oh, you're saying you're saying the Devils came back on, on yeah. Twitter? Yeah, they came back, like, quote tweet of the quote tweet. But if you're going to do that, you got to really be funnier. And Well, and, and they've been absolute dog shit lately. They fell off harder than any team. Even Buffalo's playing better than them right now. What are they? One, I had 1-8-1 one, one in their last 10 
Uh, you said one, eight and two in their last 11, right? RA? That's what I had. Yeah. They lost five in a row, one, eight and two in their last 11. Uh, it's funny because they traded a lot of guys and they just kind of went in a spiral and Buffalo kind of a different scenario. Obviously they brought in the new coach biz, but once that, I mean, even before that, then once the de- deadline passed, these kids are playing like the way everybody thought they were going to play and they're doing it without Eichel. I mean, they had a two, one in one week, they're six, three and two since they lost that 18th game. Just looks like a totally different team out there. Uh, Eichel is out for the rest of the year. He's going to need some surgery, but these kids are getting it done. I mean, middle stat, Ryan Hart, these kids are scoring like we thought they would. See that, Whip? Look at that notepad, Brando. Those are fucking notes, that. buddy. Take take notes on my notes. Uh, Sabres, they fired Kruger mid-March. They went 0-6-1 out of the gate with uh, Don Granado stepping in as the interim coach. Since then, as of Monday, 6-3-2. Wins against Caps, Pens, and Flyers in that time. Other than uh, other than one game, which is a 6-3 loss, uh, and it came to the New Jersey Devils, who we were just ragging on, every game they've lost in that stretch that I mentioned, that 6-3-2, and two, it's all been by one goal. So far more competitive than we've seen the rest of the year, and this team is starting to turn around. Now, Wit, I haven't been much a part of this. You have most in your career to teams that are out of it by Christmas. Now, does part of this have to, does part of this have to do with that? There's no pressure at this point. It's the end of the season. They got some younger guys in the lineup with legs that are getting the ice time. And they're just, there's no pressure on these guys right now. Yeah. There's been no pressure on them since like the sixth game of the year, but they, they got some goaltending Tokarski's first star of the week, right? All year. They've had no goaltending. I don't think the Sabres were nearly as bad. If Allmark wasn't injured, he's good. And they chose not to trade him. They can, they can try to resign him. He's UFA. He's a good goalie and they've had nothing. And then Tokarski played real well. And you're right. Guys are playing loose. Something's clicked in where they're almost like, finding an identity. I, I know that's like such a cliche, but they had nothing going. You you just every night it was like lethargic and, and all of a sudden now they're they're like outworking teams and maybe guys are getting chances and just feeling better with a different coach's attitude. But it was a struggle right off the, the bat with Granado too. So it's yeah. not like you could say right away that he switched it around. Something well, ends up clicking where I, when we were in Pittsburgh, the year we were my rookie year, Crosby's rookie year, I should say, I was a little tag along. We did get hot. We were horrible. And then at the end of the year, we got pretty hot. And it's like, I don't know what it is. Teams really start. I'm not saying not, not get prepared for you, but they underestimate you a little bit. And then you just get a little goaltending and you're off. So I was talking to Marty Biron and he said that mostly he just says uh, structurally defensively, they look a lot better. Uh, The D are getting a little bit more of the green light to join in the play and, 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 you know, maybe hold the line a little bit. And I, Fuck, man, sometimes the Coyotes play so conservative. I say that, too. I'm like, fucking, fucking pinch, man. You got the F3 right there. If he gets by a big deal, scoop it up. You're fucking in the neutral zone and play with the thing a little bit. Try to keep it in the offensive zone. And he says they've been doing that, mixed in with some of these youthful legs. And one of the names you did mention in the, in the text thread, RA, was uh, Middlestad, who, you know, we were questioning what he had and, and you know, in the last little stretch here, he's been finding the back of the net. I know that you've poked your head in on some games. You said he looks a lot more impressive. Yeah, I've been bet. I, I wrote last week. I mean, this is a good time to bet some bad teams because a lot of t- good teams are kind of locked in the playoff spot. So, you know, I think they're um, not ambition. What's the word? I don't know. They're, maybe they're not as into it. Whereas a team like Buffalo and Detroit, they've been some tough outs last week alone. Buffalo covered a puck line at pl- plus 700 and another one at plus 600. So, yeah, I mean, middle stat's been good. Reinhardt's been good. It's just like they're playing loose. The, the two veterans get traded, Hall and Stahl, and, and that feels like it maybe kind of unburdened them to like, all right, we're just going to be the, the young kids playing our game here. And obviously it's worked for them so far. So, you know, Buffalo's not out of the, out of the woods yet. They still got some work to do, but at least the fans have something to watch. Well, we've been taking sky the dumps market. on them for the last four months, so we figured, hey, let's let's uh, let's turn this fucker around, boys. Wouldn't you want to keep losing, though, if you're a Sabres fan? Like, they're going to win themselves out of the first first overall pick. Well, I don't think so. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, I mean, if they're only three points behind Ottawa, but at the same time, mm-hmm. Ottawa's playing good too. If anything, I would think New Jersey, if they keep sinking, they could end up in that spot. But of course, there's a lottery, so you're not guaranteed the actual number one spot. But either way, all right, boys, I think it's about time we brought on superstar goal, goal scorer, David Pasternak, a.k.a. Pasta. Look how Later. giddy RA is because we got another Bruin on. Uh-huh. I love it. Uh, hey, you guys are giddy too. Don't don't play don't play dumb here. No, he first, was awesome. Uh, he's, he's, he's a fun guy to talk to. But first, whether she prefers a statement piece or everyday subtle elegance, 
BlueNile.com has fine jewelry for every mom. Mock Mother's Day with something enduring, classic diamond stud earrings, elegant tennis bracelets, birthstone pendants, and so much more on BlueNile.com. Celebrating the special women in your life? On BlueNile.com, you can easily navigate thousands of fine jewelry options at every price point. BlueNile.com is also great for anniversary and birthday gifts, but just to say, I love you. Pick from a vast selection of preset diamond jewelry. Blue Nile offers endless options of carrots, metals, and settings ready to ship the same day, or build your own diamond jewelry with online tools that seamlessly walk you through the process. I'm going to show you a gorgeous pair of earrings right here. Where's the logo? Blue Nile. Look at these bad boys. These are gorgeous. My, my old lady's hot as, hot as hell anyways, but she throws these on. She's even hotter. So check out BlueNile.com. You get expert advice, 24-7 legendary service with 30 days return, 30 day returns. And Blue Nile is different from their competitors. They don't mock up to mock down. That means BlueNile.com's everyday prices are competitive to other online retail sale prices. And when you commit to a piece, so does Blue Nile. It's guaranteed service and repair for life. So this Mother's Day, Give mom something she'll treasure forever with jewelry from BlueNile.com and Spit and Chicklets listeners get $50 off your purchase over $500. This podcast exclusive is only good for Chicklets listeners. Use the code Chicklets. Again, that's code Chicklets, C-H-I-C-L-E-T-S. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress-free on BlueNile.com today. Again, check these bad boys out. I want your girl look even hotter or your partner. Check out BlueNile.com. And now we're going to send it over to Pasta, David Pastanak. Well, it's been a little over two years since we had this guy in the show at the All-Star Game in San Jose. Since then, he's become one of the game's elite snipers, winning the Rocket Rashad Trophy last year, along with Ovechkin, and being named a first-team All-Star at season's end, as well as finishing fourth in MVP voting. This guy's a blast to watch on the ice, having fun out there, and we're psyched to get him back on the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Thanks for joining us once again, David Pastanak. How you been, Pasta? Hey guys, good to see you. Thanks for having me back again. It feels like forever. God damn it. That was it feels like two another years life ago already. Yeah. You guys had me in that bus on the in San Jose. <laughs> I was I was looking way better last you've time. You've really I was popped off from then. Cabo. Yeah, you, hey, you've popped off on the ice, but you look like shit off the ice compared to that. You were rocks. That's when Dana Beers was throwing up in the back room on the bus, Mikey. Isn't that the same interview? It was. That is it was. Point. That's right. Uh, so you guys yeah. just got a little injection of talent at the trade deadline. Did the room get a little bit above us knowing you got a shitload of guys coming in to help the team or what? Uh, yeah, it's awesome. Obviously, it's been it's been fun to, yes, yesterday and, and today, you know, get the new guys. Uh, seems like a great guys. So obviously, uh, I don't know them uh, yet that well. But, uh, you know, obviously, they, they helped us pull a big win yesterday against Buffalo. So, uh, you know, excited, excited. We got the huge talent in the locker room. So it's going to be fun, hopefully. Have you ever played a schedule like this before where you're just playing the same team over and over and over again? No, no. And especially coming off uh, of the week we had last, we played five and seven. I don't think I've ever done that in my That's career either. So it, it was crazy, you know, same teams. But, you know, obviously uh, the whole season it's uh kind of different so it's always a good experience but hey we're, that's but, what we were playing in the american league five and seven that's what they were preparing those guys for no i never did the five and seven but i did four and five four times in a row to finish the season once in wilkes Bear. <laughs> wednesday friday saturday sunday so five and seven's an even bigger joke yeah i, I mean I've been, I, I've been in hl too so I, I can tell you guys uh i played three and three <laughs> You played like what twenty games in the AHL. You didn't experience the real grind of the always hungry league. Yeah, I, I think I played between uh, twenty four, twenty seven games, but uh, great experience. You know, uh, learned a lot from the older guys. Had a great group there, and so uh, so happy I went through it. You know, the last time we talked to you, uh, you know, you were big into the fashion. It seems like you kind of got this loose collar shirt on, rocking some, a few chains there too. Is that the new style? Looking a little bit like Biebs. <laughs> <laughs> oh man I, I it's just a tough day today you know just when uh work my ass off at the ring and came home and <laughs> just stay in the same clothes as i dress up at 8 a.m so uh <laughs> well we got 8 p.m uh you know just t-shirt home t-shirt man just uh, being cozy you know hey uh, all your first guy to get there last guy to leave past everyone knows that about you helping picking up uh, the pucks at the end yeah. of practice just working <laughs> your bag off every day every day man <laughs> well, I, I want to ask because you mentioned older guys and 
Zidane Ochara, you've played against him a few times now, but he got to see that video with some fans in the arena. How, how, how good was that? And then also, how weird was it playing against him that first time? Oh, man, I, I, I got chills, especially because it was second game, right? Him being back, but first game with uh, at least the, some of the fans. So, obviously, when the fans was in the building, it gave me chills, you know, especially like big man, uh, big part of me growing up as a person and uh, as, a, as a pro athlete. So, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of thank him about, but uh, the main thing that stick in my head is with the game, game seven when he played after the surgery, right? And and I was actually telling Marshy that, like, it's crazy how on the jumbo throw doesn't even sound that, that loud, but I remember standing on that blue line and all the fans just screaming that he's actually playing in that game. It was uh, obviously great memories, and, and uh, we all miss Z, and we all know how, how, how good a pro he was and, and, uh, and leader. So uh, it's awesome, but at the same time, it's, it's crazy to play against him, you know, and... and uh, so, like I'm so scared to talk to him on the ice because I know he's so in the, like he's so in the game that I'm like I, we speak same language but I'm just so quite uh, setting up on, next to him on the face off so I'm, I I just let him <laughs> let him focus so uh, it's weird. Do you know the term Tommy sticks? Tommy sticks? Yes. We just tap in sticks to say hello or? Yeah, Biz uses the term in terms of guys yeah. out there laughing it up against someone they're playing against and and for the most part. Zidane Ocharna is the exact opposite of Tommy Stinks. He doesn't give a shit. If you started <laughs> laughing with him, he'd probably slash you. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fun. So, Pasta, when you would see when you were playing with him, if he would see other Czech players from other teams, like even during the game and and even in warm ups, he was very stone cold. And then he would wait to after in the hallway, then to go talk to them. Yeah, that, that's pretty much you put it right on on the spot. You know. Uh, uh, that just show how 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 main focused he is on this game and how much he loves it and he's uh, you know big pro so he's just focusing on the game. Obviously, uh, the first two games we didn't talk much, but the third game I, I finally was like I, I gonna talk to this guy on the face off <laughs> and and uh, he just gave me he just yelled at me that I didn't reply to his text, which was not true by the way. But um, so I guess he was the one who didn't reply my text. But uh, so he gave me a little chirp there right away uh, that I didn't reply. So. Uh, Buck dropped and I skated away. Rather, <laughs> the, the the first thing I could think of is is was Z's early days when Yager came up and Yager's trying to say hi to him and he's just like ghosts him. He suckers him. <laughs> now um, I want to bring up Yager though. He's still over back home playing, still scoring goals. Like <laughs> how? Like would you still talk to buddies who might go to games back home? Hey man, man that's crazy because obviously uh, Vladar, Vladar, our. Uh, goalie who's up here now is also from Czech. He's from the same uh, town uh, as Yaks, right? So he played there growing up, and he basically he's the owner of the club, and he's still playing. So you know, obviously <laughs> your teammate is the owner in the locker room. So he's like, I, I can't even imagine, man. He's obviously like, listen, I can't believe he's still playing and scoring, and he's still open. In, it's 2021, and you still open Czech newspapers about sport and you're reading about Jagger every morning. So it's it's legendary, you know, and it's crazy. And I can't even imagine. Asta, I want to ask you about uh, a tweet back from the uh, around the bubble, the tweet about Tom Wilson. You said, in my opinion, Tom Wilson is the best goal scorer in the league. What's the story behind that? <laughs> I think if there is a place to tell the truth, this is it. So uh, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we respect always, that, Pasta. I obviously lost a bet, okay, Um uh, which I was really confident going into. And uh, <laughs> the bet was basically, if I lose, I'm going to make this tweet. And if I win, me and Tom Wilson, because we played the round robin, right? We played against Washington. So this bet happened before round robin. And if I would won, we would drop gloves. And basically, I would throw a punch and knock the shit out of Tommy. <laughs> which he... <laughs> Oh, well, he was I risking said, a lot then. He was risk. That's what he said. That's why he was saying, I, I knew I'm going to have to win this battle. So he said he gave it all. And, and he always beat me by by mile. And uh, not really going to get into what the bet was, but he beat me <laughs> by mile. And uh, yeah, so I, I tweeted out and, and uh, you know, it was kind of funny. And, and uh, it's crazy. I still get the tweets till this day. You know, every goal he scored, I just get the... Uh, mentioned on it and, and that I was right. So, uh, yeah, I got absolutely roasted in that bet. 
I know yeah. he chugs beers so fast. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty good, man. I was real. Oh, I heard going into that too, man. I, I heard it was iguana wrestling. <laughs> is that how That's you say? That's a good it? one. Hey, hey, I that that will never leave my memory. This is one of my favorite memories of Grizzly absolutely beating the shit out of Charlie McAway's. <laughs> I still have the video on my phone till this day, and I will never. I, I love it, man. It's he's a bulldog. He's Absolute a little bulldog. bulldog. I would. I would have thought McAvoy would have crushed him in that, though. Like okay, that's pretty impressive. Like, imagine we were betting money on that. Everybody would lose. Like it was. Oh yeah. insane. Big was... boy Chalky would have been minus three hundred in that little battle, but the Charlestown boy <laughs> just rips his head off. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask: Have you ever personally wrestled? Hey, uh, so I know this is stories, okay, world championships, all these Canadian and Americans wrestle uh, in the room. I think it was my first first world championship that I heard about wrestling on the hotel rooms that we were same uh, floor as Canadian team. And we're like, what is going on? Why? Is so so uh, basically, yes, I did it one time. I wrestled with Tim Schaller. No, sorry, Sean Corrali. And uh, I made him tap out. Can't believe oh. it till this day. I can't oh, believe it. That's another underdog win, I would think. Right? Yeah. He's kind of yeah. a rangy bastard. So yeah, he's he's strong. So I I was I don't know what I was thinking, but I don't know if it was letting me or something. But I can't believe that because I was chirping him for this for a while, and um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my only time. And you know, you're gonna finish on the top, so I never went back to that. Boys, I think the league should start doing instead of shootout, one guy from each team has to line up at, at center ice and they iguana wrestle for who's going to get the extra point. I'm not, you, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I think that's the best idea you've ever had in your life. <laughs> Imagine the the people tuning in for those at the end of the game. Who would you guys send first, um, uh, Pasta? If you guys had to, let's say if it was a best of three round, who would you send up as your three guys for the iguana wrestling for the Bruins? That's so easy, Bisa. I'll tell you right now. Um, you're going to save Ge- Kevin Miller for game three, I think. That's oh, sure. yeah. <laughs> He's the you closer. Save, He's yeah. the closer. <laughs> you have to save Kevin Miller for game three. And then I would definitely uh, go like... I have I have number one, but I'm thinking about number two right now. And uh, I think I'm going to go with Chris Wagner, you know, as a number game two. And wait, wait for this. Game one, John Moore. Zero chance, everybody. We are going. If I'm going with John Moore, I already know in winning one nothing in the series. John so. Moore's that legit at it. Absolutely. So John Moore, ver- John Moore versus Kevin Millar, and it's a possible coin flip, or is that beast just taking anyone? Down? Oh my god, that that is that is tough fun. <laughs> that is a coin flip, but I think. Pasta, let me ask you this: Did you not pick Marshawn because he's not clutch in shootouts because he overskates the puck? <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, yeah. I guess let's leave it on that. that was, I almost forgot about it. That's that's a good story. Oh. What 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 was what was the back? So you were on the bench laughing. It, what was Tuka Ra, Tuka Ras not sitting there and had to go? No, down I was not laughing at all, man. I we lost <laughs> the game, right? So, but I, I obviously on the shootout, you in the Philly, you I'm the last guy on the bench, straight to the tunnel, right? But Marsh is going towards the left side and the tunnel is towards the right side. So my head is obviously turned to the left and he missed it. So we lost the game. So I turned around to the right and obviously the backup goalie usually waits till everybody goes to the room. And I just look at Tuka being in his freaking turtles like this, <laughs> dying laughing. And I don't think much of it, but it just freaking blows me out. I started laughing so much. But I obviously I forgot walking into the tunnel. I'm a first guy, and always there's like a camera right in my face, and I'm like, oh my god, if this comes out. We just lost the game, and but like it was so funny. I, I could, I can't forget the face of Tuka being just up to his eyes, <laughs> hidden in the in the shoulder pads. So now it's obviously funny, funny to talk about. Uh, only time I've seen the ever, only you, time I've seen the turtle win is usually when a coach is yelling and somebody's laughing and they kind of sink in, <laughs> in in the locker room when he's when he's losing his mind. Oh, if you ever got called in like by Cassidy that he was pissed off, you were laughing. You'd be like, you pull up that clip right now and you try not to laugh watching it in front of me. <laughs> yeah. And it won't happen because it's one of the best bloopers I've ever seen. Tuka, oh. that's awesome. When was that? That was in Philly. Yeah, well, I think that, that might have been. That was actually last 
last game pretty much before the COVID started. No, maybe not. I, I think it was definitely one of the uh, last games last year. Dude, speaking of last year, I mean, like you, the year before you really dominated, you played 66 games, but then last year it was like just another level, one of the best players in the NHL. And, and it must have been so brutal, not only for you, but the team. You guys were rolling when COVID hit. Was there something that changed in the offseason the year before that really you felt that much better going into the season? To be honest, I, I actually, uh, before this year, obviously, I had uh, in the offseason, I had surgery. But before uh, this year, I have not changed anything uh, since I get to the NHL. I had the same strength coach. I had everything same. You know, it's, it's been working for me. I was elevating my game every year. So I, I haven't... Uh, I haven't been. I haven't changed much uh, before that last year. So I, I was doing everything. If if something then this year obviously was totally different, you know, between the off season with all this COVID and and my surgery, obviously I, I got to know uh, my body totally different. Like you know, uh, all these uh, little exercises for for my hip and and stuff was obviously a little different. But it was great experience, you know, and and uh, injuries are part of it. So uh, it was it was definitely tough mentally you know obviously I'm very outgoing my big part of uh, of of ice workouts are like the other sports like soccer and tennis you know for running I I don't want to go run and in the circles for uh, 30 minutes so I, I do all other sports so it was challenging for me this uh, off season but uh, you know just it's part of it Bust, I want to ask about Patrice Bergeron he's one of you know one of the most respected guys in the league what makes him such a great leader for, for you and for the Bruins man it, it's incredible you know it, to, to be with him in the locker room every day uh, is, is just insane. And, and uh, I, I kind of knew this question is going to be coming. So I, I was trying to prepare. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's so, it's, he's a, one of these leaders that uh, you, you just going to be in that locker room to hear him, man. He, as soon as he opens his mouth, you know, everything sounds perfect. <laughs> everything sounds perfect. You know, it's not even his first language, but he's just, you know, always have the right. Uh, right say and, and what he's saying about so you know you, you would just have to meet him be in the locker room it's very unbelievable uh leader you know and, and i'm so lucky to 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 play online with him and learn from him the funny thing is like me and marcy we, we bark at each other a lot you know during the games and and in the kind of funny way we, we love each other you know of the ice and and stuff but but on the ice we kind of have sometimes uh, uh a little barking at each other but then, then he's, then Bergy is just sitting in the middle of us. And, and, uh, I remember me and Marshall was just going at it for like good 30 seconds, like back and forth. And, and then just Bergy goes like enough and absolutely <laughs> silent, like silent. That. No other word was spoken <laughs> till the next shift. And this is just uh, unbelievable, you know, the, uh, so I'm so lucky to, to, to be, uh, his uh, line man and learn from him every day. He's what, legit what? driving a station wagon, Biz, <laughs> and his two kids are in the back seat. Yeah. He's had enough at one point. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah, National Lampoon's. Uh, uh, when, when you're chirping back and forth on the bench with Marshy, is it little things like, hey, put that on my tape? And he's like, oh, fuck you. You missed me one last shift. Like, little <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, not really about that. We're more like, uh, you know... <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes, like, he... He, we always get uh, get on each other. He gets on me, like sometimes being, you know, hard on the pucks and harder uh, and and playing harder, you know, on, on the forecheck and stuff. And sometimes I I get on him about, you know, setting up on the PP instead, you know, just the little things, just a classic hockey. Like, um, but how I said we love each other, it's it's obviously fun uh, and uh, uh, we always have a good laugh after it. But. Is that one thing that you've taken from him since playing with him? Because like I know all summer long he trains with Sid, and talk about two guys who are, like, are a little bit undersized given today's standards, but they are so fucking good along the walls. It's incredible. They it's, never never lose puck battles. No, it's it's actually yesterday that, that I asked him like, what do you like? How how you he protects the puck so well? I I don't think I have. I think he protects the puck. He's one of the freaking better, better, best players in the in the league by protecting his puck. You know, that's crazy. He just put it in his feet, and he has yeah. a long stick for his size. He has a long stick, so I I don't understand how he freaking put the stick like between his feet and still makes plays from from his feet. You know, and and he, that's what he said. He's like, I just put it between my feet and and cover it with my body. So he's definitely one of the best players uh, uh, with freaking being strong on the puck and and. Seems like just sticks to him, you know. So, uh, 
uh, yeah, I just told him about it for 10 minutes yesterday because every time I turn up, I feel like my puck is so far away from my body, you know? So uh, yeah, it's crazy. He also, a lot of guys do it against the wall. He's on a one-on-one and he somehow like will pivot and throw it in his feet. And I mean, as a defenseman, I was terrible going on anyone against the one-on-one. But for that, it's like you don't really know how to approach it because all he's waiting for you to do is push on his back and he's sliding off you the other way. He's always like going off of the people's shoulders. So I don't know. To see him do that, I, I can't imagine like you just try to get open. You know he's coming out of the corner with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's the thing. You know, he, you just room it behind and that you know he's – somehow get it even even like on the face-offs you know it's not hard for the wingers it's hard I mean it's not easy for the wingers sometimes the face-off is 50-50 you know and it comes to the to the D and the forward on the winger you know and he's so good at just lifting the puck stick and, and just getting the puck to the point and you know so these little things is just incredible but at the same time you know I see him practice every day I see how uh, competitive this guy is he 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 battles every every single day in the practice. So uh, you know, obviously, it's coming from there. There, I'm pretty sure. Asta, a few months ago, you were a big hit at Lake Tahoe. Had the old school yellow jerseys yeah. on, but whose idea were the Macho Man sunglasses? Well, that that was uh, that was actually part of my outfit. You know, we did 80s, 90s outfits, but <laughs> it was a part of my outfit. And uh, I obviously came in the uh, what is it called when we were not the locker room, but we had like uh, the warming hut, the thing? bang bus. <laughs> no, it was like the tent. Tent. Oh, no, oh no, yeah, that. Oh yeah, the tent. Yeah. Yeah, that's tent. Right. Okay. Yeah, so right. I was like, I was, yeah, that's close. Uh, you got a nice <laughs> hair though. Anyway, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so I was in the tent for like hour and a half, or hour forty five, right? Since we got, I I didn't leave the tent. I I, I warmed up in the tent and stuff. And then I just came out the tent and it was so bright. And I would just, and Bergy was like right in front of me. I was like. Bergy, you might you mind if I run back for the sunglasses and wear them on the warm He's like, no, go ahead. I was like, yes, yeah. I was so happy. I was running back to the sunglasses and and um, you know, obviously didn't know it's gonna be such a big hit. And uh and it, it was fun, man. It was amazing and I enjoyed it so much. I did and then the post game interview. That that was awesome. You guys came out, you're bumping Barbie girl after the win. Dude, I, I was the DJ. I was the DJ. Last time I was DJ was when Tori Krug was sick and we played in Washington after they won their cup first game in the season and we lost seven nothing. So I have never got to be DJ again. And uh that was my second chance. So I I put the eighties on for the whole before game, guys was pumping it up, loving it. So and then I, I came obviously back after the game and they were like, put a Barbie girl song on. So I, I just put it on and and immediately I was like started feeling it right it was fun we won the game yeah like you're only and human I ju- and i just got a. was like you're gonna talk to media so i was kind of disappointed at the same time so i was like i'm wearing these sunglasses because i just want to get out of there no that was a, that was quite the moment it was all over the internet buddy i haven't i actually haven't seen it because i can't even i can't even hear myself speaking english you know it's it's just uh Oh, I just mumbling all the words around, and and this, sometimes this is what uh, comes out, you know. How do you feel, all right? To the club. Uh, what about... <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the club. All right, well, listens to every you're... one of our episodes. Imagine that. <laughs> uh, no, I, I want to ask Pasta. You you show up the games with some from some nice suits, some funky stuff once in a while, but they also let you guys go casual in the bubble. Do you think the teams or maybe the league should let uh, let, let up a little bit, and let guys you know dress, dress a little more casual? Uh. Yeah, I, I mean, before the bubble, uh, I thought, yeah, it would be a good idea, you know, to to have no outfit rule and stuff and, and kind of like let your personality grow a little bit more. In the bubble, we obviously had no outfit rule, but we still kind of had an outfit rule, you know. So it was like right in between. So uh, I was, I mean, I don't mind the suit, you know. I, I think it's either all or nothing. I think uh, you either have legit your own option and uh or you have to go fully suit and i don't mind neither of those so uh uh after the bubble experience i would say i would stick with the suits for sure now I, i've got one more for you when you you know first get to the bees locker room you obviously have a vibrant personality but that first locker room you got a lot of serious veterans in there were you just quiet and trying to listen or were you trying to be yourself how did that all work out your first year with the bees my f- oh man i i just I was silent. Like, obviously, I was just <laughs> smiling around and, and just 
just smiling and creeping, man. <laughs> just trying to <laughs> learn from all the all the big dogs, you know. And then Luch like would walk in like, and then I would just like sink in the in the stall, like <laughs> try to hide. No, but obviously there's a lot of big guys there, and uh, you know, obviously a uh, big core who won the cup. So I was legit just silent, smiling, and trying to learn, and you know, put my head down, and this is what I gonna do. He just celebrated his thousandth game. Did you text him? Yeah, I, I, I'm so happy for him. You know, it's he took a big care of me when we were kind of close neighbors when I my first uh, couple of years. So, uh, so happy for him. I saw he dropped the gloves too on his thousand game. So, so it's unbelievable. I did, I did text him and and uh, happy for him. And not many like Luke Big Luch. I, no, I said, he's old school. I, I saw that someone sent a tweet like. Who actually plays their thousandth game and squares off at center ice? It was just that was so perfect, Luch. He's actually come on the show with us a couple of times, and he's got so many good opinions on the game. I love chatting with him because oh, yeah. people, I think people think that maybe he's so quiet and stuff, but if you get to know him, he's an absolute blast to hang out with. Yeah, he, he's the best. You will, you will not be bored with him, that's for sure. He can <laughs> he can gas beers, crush Cr- with his like, teeth. I would love to see Tom Wilson and Milan Lucic uh, battle for a chug beer. Okay. I, I saw I saw both of them chug it, and whew, that would be a tough battle. <laughs> Pretty good crap, too. <laughs> hey, I got a question. It's a little more on a serious note, but right now Tuka's out, and you realize how much this team like needs him. And I don't know, and I'm guessing you don't pay much attention, but. So many fans are complaining about Tuca, and he catches so much heat from so many n- absolute morons, I think, in Boston. Does it bug you as a teammate of his to see that when fans get on him? It does not bug me because I I know he he yeah. has no idea. And, you know, he, he just – this is nothing he can do, you know. This is just uh, – this is just roles that hit him in his life, and this is just the way it is, you know. I, he can do anything about it, you know. He's if you know Tux, he's just a such a nice, calm guy, and you know doesn't. I mean, this is hard for me in English right now because I I don't know the right words. But you know, he he's just so calm about everything, and and doesn't doesn't uh, you know take opinions that are not seriously, you know, really yeah. much heavy or hard to his head. You know, he's just a calm guy. He's gonna show up to the ring every single day. You know. Uh, work, work, uh, work his uh, butt off and and uh, and leave. But you know, that's just yep. two guys, and and I, we all love him in locker room. He's an unbelievable guy, and and personally, one of my closest friends there. Yeah, basically, you're just saying that he doesn't let anything from the outside just even bother him. He's going yeah, about absolutely. his business. Okay, I hear yeah, you. yeah, yeah. Is pasta actually your pregame meal? Is that true? Yeah, I, it's actually the only thing I eat. I. Uh, uh, sometimes I, I um, skip breakfast. Usually on optional optional skates, I, I skip breakfast if I don't go on the ice. You know, so I'm perfectly hungry for the lunch. And yeah, that's why I just eat the spaghetti and meat sauce, man. <laughs> that's all I do. Now, didn't didn't you drop it one time in an elevator? We heard, and you ended up having yeah. to get subway, yeah, and you had you, yeah. four goals that night. Is that true? Oh my god, I, <laughs> it's funny. I wait, I did totally. You must have heard that from. I know exactly. That was we don't wait telling story. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm coming, park my car outside, obviously having lunch, you know, in my in my uh, one hand, phone, which is normally in this world, and drinks and some bio still in my other hand. And just going to the elevator, obviously full hands, trying to press the button and boom, whole meat sauce and pasta and spaghetti just all on the elevator. And I'm just freaking out. It's like 1230. I'm like, oh my God, it's I need to nap. Like, what am I going to do? I've not gonna cook spaghetti and meat sauce and stuff. So, so I, <laughs> I ordered a subway actually, the food, nice food, long, you know, and and uh, scored scored three goals that game. <laughs> All right, he lives in the north end and he got subway. subway. Now, did you get subway the next game because you scored three goals? I don't. I'm not. I'm not like this. I, I'm no. not very uh, superstitious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> with that, uh, uh, not very superstitious. I uh, did save it. I usually, when something works, I'd be like, okay, I come back to it like in three weeks, try it again. And uh, that's a good point. I actually have not come back to the subway 
I, I think I'm waiting till I drop it off next time in the elevator. I might drop it off on purpose next game because I've been grinding here lately. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gonna have some you gotta get the, the hands elevator. going again. Just drop that pasta. <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah. Sid would have been chucking pasta sauce all over his head every game. He would have had Vitaly doing it for him. Uh, oh oh my goodness. Uh, Tori Krug, we haven't discussed him. I mean, obviously, seeing him leave must have been very, very tough for you, buddy. Yeah, big time. Obviously, my. You know, really close friend and my neighbor, right? So we were spending a lot of time together um, in the season and off, off season. So, you know, tough. Uh, but this is the hockey world, right? You can't do anything. We are still in contact. He just celebrated 30th birthday uh, the other day. So um, I was texting him, you know, I'm obviously having a baby. He's uh, waiting for a second baby. So I text him, um we have a lot of celebrating to catch up this summer. So I obviously miss him. You know, he's a great guy. Well, well loved to be around in the locker room and comes in every day, uh, have some good stories. You know, the classic, classic American college guys, they always have something to talk about. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm really miss Tori, but uh, hopefully see him in the summer. Any names picked out for the, the baby? Uh, sounds so easy, but we are very, very absolutely zero chance. We, we try. We started to call some names, and then obviously in a week or two, it's just like, oh my god, this is not gonna work. <laughs> so and also like my girl, she's Swedish, I'm Czech, and we live in America. So we're mixing all this. Like my mom doesn't speak English, so we're like, oh my god, she won't be able to pronounce this name. Oh and stuff. yeah, you got different factors. <laughs> so, so this is this is funny. Hey, it's Dave Pasternak. <laughs> it's Bob. gonna be interesting. Uh, the choose, but now we're always excited and and uh, be tough. Yeah, you left home at sixteen. Was that a tough move for you? And why did you decide on Sweden at that age? Uh, I I had two options technically. I could go to Canada, you know, and Canada and Sweden. And uh, I remember my agent telling me that, and I was like, I'm going to Sweden. I was like 167, not even 150. 50 pounds i was like i can't go to canada they're gonna destroy me over there in the junior you know so i was like sweden is the move and and it was tough it was tough because i'm very talkative guy and stuff you know i i want to get i want to be well like around the guy in the locker room and and i want to be part of conversation and i couldn't speak right so i was just sitting there and couldn't say i couldn't speak swedish couldn't speak english and uh, so that was tough but uh, you know it's it's crazy how uh how I, I was thrown in the ocean and I, in three months, three months uh, from then, I, I was just speaking English and having conversation with the teammates. And I have absolutely zero idea how I learned, you know, how I like, I can't even explain, but obviously, so uh, it wasn't hard. The only hard part was like, I couldn't talk to the guys, but uh, you know, I didn't get homesick. I, I was enjoying it. I was like, you know, I have to grow up at some point anyway. So uh, it was a great experience. You know, I, I would never, I would never be where I'm at if I wouldn't make that move in my career. I'm just curious, is that like, because there's a Czech senior league, right? But was it more about getting getting seen more in the Swedish league or over in Canada in terms of your being your draft year or the lead, years leading up to your draft? Yeah, that was definitely the the draft. You know, the uh, yeah. obviously uh, the you don't the only in, if you're a Czech player and you're playing in Czech. It's not many scouts flying to check, uh, although we have a good beer there, so I don't understand why not. <laughs> <That's> true. <laughs> but, uh, Very good. And rockets. But you, you don't get uh, many s- scouts there, so obviously your only chance is the word uh, junior 18, right? And, and if that doesn't go well, then you're screwed. So uh, it was easy decision for me. And how I said, I was, you know, I, I was back in Czech, I would always like, you know, you would be having workouts, you would do like, you would have to do like 10 reps of squats and I would always do like six, you know, and stuff. And then I came to Sweden as a 15, you know, turning 16 that summer. And uh coach comes into the gym and he just posts the workout and he leaves. I'm like, this, that, this, that happened in Czech. There's zero guys who would make that workout. <laughs> and every single guy in that team just stood up and do the workout. And I'm still sitting there. And then I all hear all these 20 blonde guys you know, just yelling at me and, and I have no idea what they're talking to me. So then until the captain, you know, came up and, and lift me up from the chair. It's like, you're going to like saying like, lift, you're going to lift, you know. So I had to work out. But it's crazy because 
the coach didn't even pay attention. He just put the workout in in the gym and left. And everybody just immediately stood up and started doing everything, you know, and every single thing on the tape, on the on, on the paper. So that was a that was huge. That's my one of my favorite story, you know, because that was a huge turnaround in my career. It's like I, I was like, okay, I guess it, it does take hard work. Did you did you drastically see the difference in your on ice performance based on all that off ice training you were doing? Yeah, hundred uh, percent. You know, you're still young, so obviously, you know, you know, lifting. For, 200 pounds or stuff but you just just doing stuff basically right that, that's all it matters you're just doing some extra stuff and that's where i uh the other thing was you could go on the ice there by yourself not not as a practice anytime you want it and that was like i was like that was heaven for me right back in czech we have one ice ring in the in the city especially where i'm from and so that was huge for me. I spent time on the ice, like two hours by myself all the time. And I, you know, just enjoying it. So it was uh, definitely could feel different right away. Hopefully we're going to get the Olympics next year. I know that's, uh, that's lined up. We'll see if it happens. Are you excited to, to get in the, have you played the Olympics before? Again. No, man. It's, it's, it's a dream, you know, come true. Uh, obviously, especially for European players, you know, it's, for me, it was so hard to follow NHL as growing up, you know, with time change and stuff. It's you obviously don't stay stay up late, and you don't have much internet back in the day uh, for myself. So uh, my only dream was to play uh, for Czech national team, right, the World Championship and Olympics. So uh, you know, I'm so that close. I'm that close, and and uh, you know, it will obviously be a dream come true. And and uh, um. Yeah, I can't. I can't really wait, and and I hope everything's gonna go right, and and uh, be able to to obviously represent my country there. I, I wanted to ask him about the the zoomy zoomy something that you texted me, Grinelli. I got to ask him some, some story. You're, you're giggling. Can you ask him the question? Yeah, Jake DeBrusque has told me that you are one of the worst uh, drinking games. You're you're terrible at drinking games on the planes. What's zoomy zoomy, by the way? <laughs> zoomy zoomy is uh, so you get one. Zumi, he's the main guy, and then you got let's say ten other guys, and obviously I'm the worst guy. This you could ever ask to explain something like that, some game like that. Can't okay, it. all right. Anyway, Zoom, and I know all of you guys know what Zumi Zumi is, but I'm gonna. I, grind I have this no out. clue what that is. Do you know what it is, Grinelli? Right. Can you explain it? Yeah, basically, like you have to be like Zumi Zumi one, and then someone has to be like one five, and you keep kind of passing so along. Everybody numbers. has a number, yeah. Everyone has a number, and you kind of have to say your number, and then say someone else's number, and then they have to go, and then they say their number, and then they say someone else's number. So it's like it's like a telephone. So Pasta's the worst player on the planet. Damn, pretty good. No, obviously, but like it's a language barrier. Hey, let's <laughs> leave it at the language barrier. Uh, it's oh, yeah. obviously speed up base, so it starts like pretty slow, but the game obviously speed ups, right? You get the main zoomy zoomy. So anytime you want to call up zoomy zoomy, he can choose the speed, so he can speed it up as much as he can, and he can slow it down as much as he can. And obviously, uh, I'm pretty good when it's slow, but uh, once it speed ups, and uh, you know, especially when I have number like thirteen, like thirteen, like it's impossible to say in a in a in a quick game. So you know, I. I I just chugged the drink then. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and when you're on your 13th beer, you cannot even remember your own so you, zoomy zoomy number. So you can't lose at this game. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, win win. Exactly. exactly. So win win, win, baby. Well, oh, Pasta, man. We, we, man, we, it's great catching up with you. It's amazing to see where your career's taken off, become a superstar, and, and we appreciate you coming on. I know you're, you guys have games every night, so give us uh, 40 minutes. I think it's uh, much appreciated. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, guys, for uh, having me. I had a blast with you guys. And, and uh, Biz, I hope I have some of your uh, scoring touch next couple games. I know, <laughs> I need buddy. It. I need, need it, Biz. We could do a couple Zoom <laughs> training sessions. I'll teach you that uh, pull and release like Matthews. I taught it to him. Fucking you're yeah. welcome, Matthews. Sends oh, yeah. By the money. way, this guy is absolutely on another level. So oh, love my it. isn't he? Pasha, yeah, get a perm. Hair. Get a perm and we can have matching uh, matching salads. <laughs> to have the blonde version. I'm gonna go work on it right now. Like, we got still 8:40. Nothing else to do. So, I'm gonna yeah, try there you go. <laughs> Send us a picture. That'll go along with this episode. <laughs> All right, pasta. Knock him dead, All buddy. Right. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.
huge thanks to Pasta for joining us, man. Just such a great kid, such a nice kid. Love chatting with him. And, of course, he got the old checklist bump. Scored a couple games later. Hopefully, he'll get a few more, get out of that little funk. Um, hey, guys, I want to tell you about Shady Rays. Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company, so they do things their way. Something that's very rare in their industry. Shady Rays are premium polarized shades at a fraction of the price of the big name brands. There's no need to overpay for sunglasses that don't hold up in the outdoors, and it's just going to get roughed up anyways. The craziest thing about Shady Rays is the warranty. This is one of the strongest warranties in all of eyewear. Replacements if shades are lost or broken for any reason. Doesn't matter what happens. You drop them in the ocean, lake, out fishing, drunk with your buddies, and you spill them in Boston Harbor, they will replace them. Try that with your typical high price shades and see if they'll help you. Even with that strong of a warranty, they still manage to make quality that seems just as good as any expensive pair that I've ever worn. The polarized lenses that look perfectly clear, and they start at just $48. Shady Rays also provides 10 meals to fight hunger in America with every order place, and they have donated over 15 million meals to date. It's another great reason to get them. They also have free returns and exchanges. You either love the shades or Shady Rays will pay you to ship them back. That's it. Change the way you wear sunglasses and join the team that has your back for life. Shady Rays is running their deepest deal of the season exclusively for us. Use the code CHICKLETS, C-H-I-C-L-E-T-S, for 50% off two or more pairs at ShadyRays.com. Buy one, get one free. You get two pairs for $48. You can't beat it, and if you lose it, they replace it. This is an unreal deal. You can redeem only at ShadyRays.com, where you can find all their newest and best shades. Myself is. I'm a turtle. I'm a tortoise shell guy. I don't know if you've noticed that over the years. Big tortoise shell sunglass guy. Yeah, my regular glasses too. Okay. You know what I'm that's talking your, about? That's that's your steez. I got a little bit distracted here because uh, Grinelli just texted something to the group chat. And it's something that you alluded to earlier on in the episode where in the North Division, Hyman, sprained MCL will meet will miss at least uh, two weeks right now. And um, even worse. Sheldon Keith's mm. comments is Hyman avoided the worst. That's for sure. Yeah. And it goes to you saying that he, you know, once you get your, your, your boot off the ice and it's not kind of locked in, that's when shit can get real messy. Yeah, exactly. Speaking, speaking from uh, expertise, Mr. No ACLs here. One other quick note is on Buffalo. I was watching them on the laptop yesterday and the craziest thing that up my feed came that uh, video of the storm in Buffalo, the bison, wherever, whatever natural park was in. Remember the one I sent you guys? It was just rampaging buffaloes. And it, I, the craziest thing, I was watching the Sabres, and it wasn't one of those things where you know your computer's listening to you like an advertisement and they poke it up. It was already in the feed that there's rampaging buffalo come on there on the Buffalo Sabres game. So to describe the video a little bit better is there were some cars pulled over on the side of this two-lane highway, and there must have been, I don't know, 500 buffalo. And these things were... Where was it? It didn't specify. I mean, presumably somewhere out west, but didn't say what state. Like two lanes each way, wit, and they just came onto the road and like they were coming like they the probably road. would have like trucked anyone anything in oh. the way. No, oh, they, I mean, there was there cars there. Day. They're fucking dead. Dunzos, Dunzos. Yeah, what was funny is when you see some of them, they'd get in the lane and they'd stop at the car, and then they they had to figure out have to get back into the fucking the stampede there or whatever. But it's just kind of hilarious because we've become kind of like a fucking animal kingdom show. For yeah, one of them was so. fucking. You the should go be a pipe. rancher. All right. You should go out west. Uh, maybe Yellowstone needs needs an extra for the next. You can get you can, there. yeah. You can sure. get a you can get a moose to have breakfast with everyone. He's gonna morning. have ostriches there. He's gonna have squirrel <laughs> the squirrel exhibit. <laughs> his his, his great grandson squirrel from his original pet clam chowder head. <laughs> Oh, I actually, well, I'm not going to get into, give it give it away, but me and another employee at Boston are going to be making a, a travel pitch for August because we don't do a lot in August, so I'm not going to get into it where, but we're going to try to do a little travel Ooh, for Who's content. your partner? Um, my guy, Lodge. We're not we haven't pitched it yet, so I don't want to say too much and blow and blow it, but we we talked about it for a while, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna try to take a little adventure together, and obviously for content purposes. So I think you say it. I think you manifest this shit to happen. All right. Yeah. I think Fuck you say yeah. the location. This, this is your. You can just you can just this say is your Erica. Pitch. Yeah. Erica, there's a video clip on our YouTube podcast episode of what I'm gonna do. Okay. He told me, Lodge, he told me what he told me. me. Lodge, oh, you know. Where, Daytona. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me and Lodge will fit right in. <laughs> he got. A, hey, hey, and one, open uh, a snake emporium. Hey, what are those? Uh, what are those packages where you go back to the same condo every year? You get the seven <laughs> timeshare. <laughs> Already got a timeshare. You, you get a free. Share. You get a free fucking Tuscaloosa. Nintendo if you take the tour. 
<laughs> uh, uh, no, where are you going, R.A.? Me and Lodge, we want to go to our ancestral homeland. Uh, we want to pitch a trip to Ireland. His parents are from there. My great-grandparents are from there. We want to basically go to Ireland, and we'll there's so much stuff that we can do over there to film and get the wrecked. content. Wrecked. Yeah, that too, and you know, have some Guinness and Jameson while we're there. But, yeah, we, we want to go to Ireland in August and uh, bring a cameraman with us and, and go on an adventure. And just, I mean, me and Lodge are pretty good with personality pushing our stuff, so uh, hopefully it'll go through. Is it a tour at the Guinness factory uh, one of the things you guys want to get accomplished? I would imagine we would put that on the list. See, that's the thing, too, is when you go to Ireland, you either fly into Dublin, which is the main city on the east you know, the east side, or you fly into Shannon, which is more rural in the west, which is where I went before. That's where I flew in. And, it, you know, I mean, you can drive to uh, Dublin from there, but it's a fuckload of drive when you're in Ireland. It's a beautiful country, but uh, hopefully so we'll, we'll get a So something, something people don't know, too. Ireland. One of the most scary places I've ever driven in my life. People go so fast there. You have to be ready to be like getting out of the way of people driving in that. Yeah, country. you're probably just on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> probably. <laughs> uh, by the way, large, hilarious. I love that I'd guy. That'd be very good. All right. There. But uh, I don't know, man, like COVID over there. I don't think you're like doing much in Ireland and England, right? Well, it, you know, it's, it would be four months away. So you, we, we all obviously would have True. to see what the situation is with that. But um, yeah, I mean, whenever this, it goes down, all right. Good yeah. luck. Well, and then, you know, I'll have to do my shows from Ireland, too. That, oh, that fuck be a few oh Jesus and, Christ. And You'll be suspended yeah. two minutes in if you're doing a show from Ireland. <laughs> I'll just tell people I'm speaking Gaelic. They won't know the difference. So um, when I was playing in the English Elite League, when I was basically Sidney Crosby of the English Elite League, not a big deal. Uh, the, the one thing that... It was so therapeutic, especially on the bus rides, even though they were very long and even going to Scotland was looking out the window and just seeing this perfectly manicured, just beautiful green grass all the time and the mountains. And it was, it was therapeutic. I, I, I could always see myself when I, when I retire to either moving to like Ireland or Scotland, or even what? maybe I could always see it down the road or maybe even New Zealand, but New Zealand is very, very difficult to get into. I have never heard you say that po- I just, po- post being done with this uh, grind of a post hockey lifestyle that you would be moving to. I, Ireland. No, I, I, I said I would consider it. I would consider or, or at least getting property over there. New Zealand would be the dream, although it is a, you know, a, a hop and a skip away. But uh, I, I want to go visit there for a long period of time first. I want to go there for like a month to vacation. Yeah, it's so funny. I've never thought about like moving from Boston. I, I mean, I thought about getting a place in the winter, right? But I've never considered living anywhere else. And I don't know why that is. I, I You just said New Zealand. Like, I could never say I'd move like a world away. I don't know what I, I don't. I think maybe I'd love it. Maybe I'd enjoy it. But I just never I never could picture myself doing that. All right. If you had to move to one other country in the world, where would you go? Probably Ireland. I mean, maybe Canada, too, because they treat, treat they treat us chicklets guys pretty well there but ireland is it's a beautiful place man and you know if you if your ancestors are from there i think when you get there you kind of almost feel like you know, there's some party that sort of home as weird as that might sound but it's just so peaceful in the west man now, my favorite spot it's a little seaside town called Doolin, which is just north of the cliffs of Moor, which are th- those beautiful, stunning cliffs. And it was cr- what was crazy going there was how nonchalant the Europeans were about walking on the path. Like, like I was petrified. I mean, you, you, you come within five feet of falling, you know, 800 feet into the water, rocks and water. And people just running like it was nothing. I mean, I was getting like anxiety watching them. But there's a little town doing it. It was like we stopped there, spur of the moment. It was like, oh my god, I could stay here for a month. Like a biz, you, what you know the town, the Bob McGann's in North Station. Yes, the original McGann's is in the town doing the the, the the man who came up. Uh, found the buy he died a few years ago in a, in a car accident really but the original mcgann's we we stumbled upon it we weren't even looking for it so we walked in there and it's almost like you feel like you're, you're home in boston again because they you tell them you're from boston they, they love you over there but yeah biz long story short longer i could definitely see myself like living in like a quiet part of island just give me the internet and, and i'll be happy every person isn't like cross-eyed at the cliffs of more like you are either so obviously no. you're like worried about like tripping over yourself <laughs> these people are sober like on a walk man I was I was driving, dude. I drove the whole way because it was me and my old lady, and like we, she wasn't getting behind the wheel driving on the other side. So I had to drive everywhere. I, I wanted to go up to Donegal. That's where my great grandparents are from. The name of Donegal is as far north as you can go in the Republic of Ireland. That's where my ancestors come from. But 
I looked at the map. I was exhausted. I'm like, yeah, Galway's as far as I'm going to make it this trip. And Galway's awesome, dude. It's just a fun city right All on right. the bay. Well, so, I, I hope you get Irish your dream. Drive. Bring uh, bring the yeah. Chicklets card. Don't go too crazy with it. And uh, let's <sighs> see some content. Absolutely, man. Me and Lats, let's let's make it happen. Like like G said, let's manifest it. We're going to manifest it. We're going to manifest it. Patrick Marlowe has manifested a career where he's going to pass Gordie Howe for the most NHL games played ever tonight. Uh, just an unreal accomplishment. I mean, Gordie Howe is one of those guys who his records just don't get broken unless Gretzky breaks them. Patrick Milo has appeared in at least one game with 37% of every NHL player who has ever played. That's 3,009 out of 8,100. Think of that. Oh, 37% of guys ever played in the NHL, he played in a game involving them. Um, I mean, we tip our hats on what, what, what was great biz. We had a couple of scenes, his last game versus the Kings. A lot of the Kings veterans went over, went out of their way to acknowledge him. And, and Mallow, he's such a humble guy. He seemed like taken aback, like stunned that they come over to, to give him props. He kind of was like, looked a little surprised. It was just such a, like a tender sportsmanship moment. Of course, the Wild did the same thing with the whole team after. Um, what I know you've mentioned a couple of times. I know you want to talk about it. Go ahead. I think that it's uh, it's an amazing night to be watching this and, and thinking, I don't think this will ever be broken. And I know it's, there's always recency bias, but you talk about records that will never be broken. I don't know. Like, I know kids are playing at a younger age, but the league, it gets young and it's staying young. And when you get older, it's going to be very difficult for a high percentage of guys to play after they're 34, 35 years old. This guy has missed 32 games in 23 seasons. I repeat, 32 games in 23 seasons. This guy played his first NHL game, and there was 170 NHL players currently who hadn't even been born. <laughs> it, it It is, like, wild to look at the... Look at the Hockey DB, whatever website you go on to check out a career. And for somebody who's been so quiet and so like humble throughout this entire ride, it's pretty fitting that he's the guy to do this, right? To just show up to work. And let me tell you something. The, the experiences I've had with guys from Canada, as an American, I'm sure another, other Americans would agree, you can tell a guy from kind of their province. Like there is a total vibe of what, Guys are like personality-wise, depending on where they're from in Canada. And guys from Saskatchewan are some of the most down-to-earth, show up, do their work, never bitch, never complain, low-maintenance type people. And you got biz in Ontario fucking trying to go to the club and dropping names and the Toronto Metro Hockey League. But Saskatchewan has down-to-earth good people. And not only is Patrick Marlowe from there, but the man who he's breaking the record, Mr. Hockey, is 200 miles away, born yeah. and raised. So shout out to that province and, and that career that Patrick, Patrick Marlowe's put together. And for what he's done and to not win a Stanley Cup, right, that's hard. No doubt for, for, for the rest of his life. It'll be on his mind occasionally. You just can't get away from that. But he gets to realize and understand that he's broken a record that as a former player, I look at and absolutely shake my head. I, I'm so amazed at it. Thousand games is the most ridiculous career. He's seven hundred and fifty-eight above yeah. it. Yeah, I, I marvel at the the fact that uh, he's only missed thirty-two. And and mind you, so we're talking on Monday here. On Wednesday, he's actually going to hit uh, nine hundred consecutive games um, in a row. And you know that's another thing that hasn't been accomplished much. I think what two other guys or three other guys have done that in the most history of hockey. Yeah, but his most consecutive seasons. Playing every game, 11. 11 times in a row, he didn't miss a game. And, well, and Gordy Howe, Gordy Howe did that five times. And yeah, and that just goes to show the longevity. And Todd McClellan touched on that. I think he coached him for seven years in San Jose, but just like the ultimate professional, not just not just preparing his body, but his mind. You know, he was he was big on the mental strength and 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 and, and uh, you know doing what it took in order to be ready to go. He also mentioned a, a, another story of even a time that he his wife had given birth to one of their kids. He took a private plane and met the guys in Nashville. Ended up playing twenty three minutes that night. I think they lost the game three two. But just like things like that, where there would be no expectation for the guy to fly cross country on a, on a day that that one of his ch children were born, but he 
takes the PGA, gets there and, and ends up playing. And, and, and obviously uh, uh, some unbelievable records too. He holds eight individual records with the Sharks. The most impressive probably being game-winning goals. He's got 101 game-winning goals for the San Jose Sharks. He scored 522 goals with them. So just mm-hmm. almost 20% of his goals have, ca- have came as game winners. Uh, 17 shorthanded goals. I know we touched on the shorties earlier, RA. 163 power play goals. So those were the most notable of the, of the eight individual records that he holds. Um, and and you, know, you mentioned how too. Uh, Marlowe, 23 seasons. How 26 seasons. How 21 All-Star games four cups, six heart trophies, six art Rosses. So he is in uh, pretty good company. And also we, we always talk about, you know, has, has Marlowe done enough individually maybe to, to reach the hockey hall of fame. I think there's no doubt, of course, oh, yeah, because yeah. of the games played also hit help Canada win um, gold medals in the t- 2010 and 2014 Olympics. And Hey, and, and listen, Hey, San Jose is a couple points out of a playoff spot too. Who, who knows? Maybe they I go know, on this crazy on. run and, and, and he ends up getting this cup, but uh, that's of course one that, that he, he doesn't deserve to miss out on, but uh, unfortunately he fell up short. I need to shout out Gordy Howe as well, because it would be unfair if you didn't include all of his WHA games, which got him over 2,100 career professional games. Jesus. So the NHL is one thing, but that just shows he was around even longer. Yeah, and and our race. Uh, I want to touch on the, the Saskatchewan comment. I I it had it wrote down. He's from Android, which is fifty people, and he grew up on a sixteen hundred square fo- uh, or sixteen hundred acre property uh, with his siblings. So these, I mean, he's a farm boy through and through, bringing the work boots every day, and uh, and 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 what a what an un- unbelievable career. Yeah, I mean, San Jose, they, they made a nice little run a couple weeks ago. They faulted a bit. They've lost five in a row. But let, taking a look at the standings here, they're only five back from Arizona. Got a game in hand. So, it's you know, nothing, nothing's over yet. These teams are going to be scrapping for, uh, for playoff spots. So, uh, again, congrats to Patty for breaking the record tonight and keep on adding to it. Uh, a few other notes from that division. Uh, Phil, uh, let's see, Phil, Philip, Philippe, Philip Grubau is going to be out at least two weeks for the Avalanche, the starting goaltender. He's uh, on the COVID protocol. I think he might have caught it. Uh, it's fortunate they picked up Devin Dubnik at the trade deadline, so hopefully they'll stay afloat in the standings there. Uh, Vegas has won six in a row. They faltered a little bit. Then. They kind of called each other out about scoring, and they've done that six in a row for Vegas. Uh, what else here? Kings uh, had an 0-2 week. They look like they might be threatening to jump in the spa playoff race, but doesn't look like it's going to happen. And Minnesota keeps chugging along. Congrats. Uh, Zach Parise reached 400 career points, became the third player in team history to do so. Uh, so kudos to him and Capo Kakinen, uh He had his 13th win of the season. Uh, he passed Darcy Kemper for most wins by a, ro- a wild rookie goalie in a single season. So congrats to those guys. Minnie's been hanging tough. They've been pretty entertaining to watch. So uh, let's head over to the central division. Uh, let's see another 1000 game. Actually, oh, you're not going to talk about the Coyotes big home win against the St. Louis blues. Well, we took that's to your cl- job, to, bitch to, yeah. to, to climb, to climb into a playoff spot. Boys, Strength of schedule. I like the Coyotes. And sorry to jump on you there, RA, but uh, what a what an entertaining game. And they got they got it done coming down from 2 0. What are you smiling about, Whit? The I'm, Yotes? I'm, I'm, I'm actually smiling because this team, the comeback Yotes, they're just they never won't out go of it. Away. It's, it's a fun team to watch. Like a bad rash. They just won't go away, guys. And <laughs> and St. Louis, I mean, I don't know. They didn't look that impressive to me. They just they they've they've definitely lost a half a step and 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 I don't know. I, I, I just uh, I think that with the strength of schedule, unless of course uh, the goaltending situation doesn't really work out for Colorado, I think that nine of their last twelve games are against either Minnesota, Vegas, and uh, and Colorado, who are at the top of the division. So uh, Coyotes are in good shape, man. They got some. They got San Jose four times. They got LA a couple times, I believe, and then and then Minnesota. So. Uh, playoffs could be a possibility, so we will have to back up our end of the season trip, boys. Beep, beep, beep. Oh yeah, we got another roadie coming up. TBA. Um, I missed the note earlier, boys. It was kind of a major one too. We got caught up in the Washington Boston stuff. Nicholas Backstrom also had his one thousandth game played. And I suppose that's appropriate because he's been so low key his whole career that he would slide to later in the show without without me mentioning it. I had it in the notes. It was an oversight. Uh, this guy. I mean, we've talked about it before. Perhaps the most underrated superstar in the NHL for the last ten years. Yeah, was it was it last week or two weeks ago? I was chatting about him and just the the career he's had. I just got the chance to know him on that one golf trip. Stick, by the way. Um, 
he is just like fun to be around low key. His, the way he plays the game is pretty similar as he is off the ice. Then he gets drinks in him. He loves chatting it up. I, he's always got a dip in. I mean, I got, I got nothing but great things to say about him. And then you get to watch, I got to watch him yesterday and the way he slows down the game is the coolest part. Cause he's not a burner, right? He's not the fastest skater in the world, but he gets it and he looks people off and he just has always been able to just find Ovechkin. And then Kuznetsov has it. He can, he can find Ovechkin. So the way he's, continue to age in the league kind of like fine wine like Bergeron they're getting older but it's like the way they play them not being the fastest skaters doesn't really matter so I've I've loved watching the play getting to play against him was difficult he's always finding the holes the triangle under your stick and between your legs whenever you think you had him kind of pinned off or maybe out of the play he finds a lane and ends up making me at least look foolish so I was gonna find the holes too yeah of course you were off ice <laughs> A powder on it. Well, again, congrats, congrats uh, Nicholas Backstrom on that huge accomplishment. In that same vein, Jordan Stahl, third guy in the last week to pass the 1,000 game th- threshold. He's another guy too. Wit, I mean, you got you was both played with him in Pittsburgh. Uh, he's probably an understated stud. I know, I know, he's more of a defensive type of guy, but just a, a consistent, perfect professional. Well, I feel bad at the fact that Witt's got to come up for oxygen after pumping Backstrom's tires, and now he's got to do Stalzy because you played longer with Stalzy than me. But just talk about a guy like a grown man at 18 came in and, and just – he was just a consummate professional, got his job done. And he played a little bit of a, of a lesser role as that third line center in Pittsburgh. But man, to be re- relied upon at a young age in order to you know hold that down. He did it with flying colors, moves on to Carolina and continues a wonderful career and, and is really, I mean, he set that culture down there. That team has been set up very nice and he's one of the, you know, the, the founding guys. He went down there with his brother and, 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 you know, the work that they put in is, has really transformed that organization back to where they were. So uh, Stalls, he's one of the nicest guys I've ever met and played with. I always tell the story about when I lost the credit card game and he went over to the server and gave it to me after that moment, you knew he was the best in my books, saving me 600 bucks at Umi or whatever the fuck it's called. And uh, is it called Umi? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> the best sushi I've ever had in Pittsburgh, but just an, an incredible career so far. And how about all these guys getting a thousand games? Like, I don't know how many players are this year have gotten a thousand games. We should have bought it's, Rolex stock. Seriously, biz. Good thing you're not in the league anymore. huh? Oh my goodness. Fucking guys, that's why bent, escrow so getting high. bent over for these guys who have 50 million in the bank. But uh, the central man, we got basically a three horse race for first place, Carolina, Florida, Tampa Bay. all keep bumping each other up and down. We got a, a three horse race for the fourth spot too: Nashville, Chicago and Dallas, uh, Dallas, two Oh, and one in the last week. They got three games in hand on Nashville, two on Chicago. They have lost Bishop and Radulov <laughs> Warthog for the year, but this is a team you cannot count out, man. I mean, let's let, take a look They're what three points back on Nashville for the fourth spot. I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me as a cup finalist last year, if this team gets in a run and uh, gets into the playoffs, we should have a nice battle there. Uh, as far as Tampa, Stamkos uh, is on LTIR. He'll be back when he's eligible. Kucherov is skating. He's on schedule to return. So uh, he's basically like, remember that gif of Sting dropping out of the sky in the wrestling ring? They're switching uh, spots. Yeah. Basically like, you know, Kucherov coming when it playoff time and, I'm sure, you know, once the playoffs roll around, Stamkos will be back, uh, hopefully, because we want to see him out there. But Well, there was there, there was some comments that they were going to let people know whether it was the the same injury that was acting up again that he that was, was in playoffs, which was hernia, correct? And did they confirm that that, that was not the case? Um, I don't think they um, – the last I checked, Stamkos, they, they, he's going to be back when eligible. That's what it said. I don't, I don't know if they confirmed any particular injury or not, but I think basically that – it's got some money thing too. If they take him off, if they put Stamkos on long term, bring Kucher off, it makes the money line up. And then once the playoffs start, it doesn't matter because the cap becomes basically irrelevant. Then. Ah, so, ah. so uh, also Tampa though, cap hey. gymnastics. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, cap, <laughs> cap gymnastics. That's a good term, Biz. Hey, I want to. No, I stole it from the NFL because they've been they just snip all these guys on the one day. Tampa oh, lost. A- uh, Tampa lost seven. In the last 12, they have seven regulation losses. Like, they're not – their power play is 12%. They're struggling. They need Stamkos. Trade sure. everybody. Get them, get rid of them. Yeah, but it's it, perfect. That's how a team – they go through a little lull before the playoffs. It's hard to keep, keep it going all year. They'll be yeah, ready. You'd My rather, cup pick. You'd definitely rather do that. What's up, Bill? Um, with, uh, what did you want to say about Stalzy? Because I, I, I don't really do a good job with the 1,000 game break. No, you did great. I just – I got to play with Stalzy briefly, but you, you kind of – 
took the words out of my mouth. He was like 6'4", 230 when he was 18. Just a man child. I remember his feet. He's got the widest feet, these monsters. I looked at my little, like, <laughs> what's that animal that stands on one leg? Flamingo? The ostrich. My flamingo ostrich feet. And then this, like, caveman's feet. I was like, oh, my God. This guy's, like, 10 years younger than me. Absolute so, rope on him. So, too. yeah, hammer. Um, and he, he also, Biz, he missed one game in his rookie year, and then I don't think he missed another game for five years or four years. He's just uh, – he's actually probably a guy who maybe could sniff 1,500 games. He's got 1,000. He's 32. He I plays he all was, the time. I think he was the youngest player in NHL history to reach 200 games. Might have even got up to 400 games because I remember when him and Vlasic, I think they broke into the league as, as 18-year-olds, and they went on the streak kind of like you were mentioning with Marlowe over, it was like 82, 82, 82, 82. So you could check out Stalzies as well because uh, he went on quite the run to, to start his career. Yeah, you know, the best abilities, availability, they say, uh, Abbas. And uh, I tell you what, I don't think anybody had a, a bigger Abercrombie collection in the <laughs> world after he'd been raking in those signing bonuses after a few years because he just – he just Huge loved. jeans. He was buying it all in the trunk of my car. Him and Luca Caputi. <laughs> Eighteen biz. I was six feet, about one sixty-five. If you can believe that. Just a skinny little rail. String bean with a. I always had a little bit of a gut, even when I was skinny. But yeah, I fucking wish I weighed one sixty-five again. I'll tell you that. Although Dallas, what are you tipping hey, the scales at right now? More than one sixty-five. <laughs> Oh, you don't feel comfortable saying? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not underweight, so yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I, I probably two. I don't go on scales, but uh, uh, two twenty awkward, maybe. I mean, yeah. Jesus, I didn't think it would go like no, this. I, yeah, I mean, you know. stuttering all over himself about his yeah, weight. Yeah, I, yeah. Those, teen, those teen, those teenage issues come bubbling up when you mention them. No, yeah, I'm probably two twenty, whatever. Everyone yeah. loves you. Hey, yeah. We love you. We yeah, love you. As long you, as I dude. keep my shirt on. What's up, Biz? Oh, not at all, buddy. Fucking. <laughs> hey, jeez. Right, couple, couple they never notes. did find the anthrax guy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was doing was trying to say how much of a string bean I was. We had to go there. All right. Uh, Columbus. Right, this isn't someone worse shape than me. 0 2 and 1 of the week. Uh, Zach War- Warensky is out for the season with a sports hernia. Um, What's his name? Uh, Max Domi was health bomb. He's going to be health bomb actually Monday versus Florida. He took some bad penalties versus Chicago. He ended up ragged on Connor Murphy, tried to get in the fight. He basically, he got called for a penalty and then he went back at him and he, he thought Connor elbowed him, but he basically skated into his face. So he acted as if he got elbowed, but when you watch the replay, he really didn't. He just tried to fight the guy, throw him in the ice, get tossed from that game, gets tossed from the next game by da- uh, versus Dallas, 14 penalty minutes thrown out in the second period, minus four. No surprise that uh, Torrell is going to bench him, Biz. Well, I think that there's one player that has to be healthy scratched every game. There's like a seat in Tortorella's office that's like the <laughs> mandatory. It's just like it's like the revolving chair. He's got the he's got the thing from the the draft. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the ball, the, the, the ball, the lottery ball. Thing? Yeah, L- lottery balls. Ding. Um, but uh, did you? I mean, he's definitely got some tie in him. Because as soon as, as he ran into to Murph, you saw the wires cross, and he looked at the official, and he fucking just basically ragged all them. And I thought that they were buddies when he played in Phoenix. So that just tells you uh, the, the, the degree to when the wires cross. It doesn't even matter if you're on his friends list. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's I'm sure it's been a frustrating season for, for everyone in that organization because, you know, they haven't achieved what they did last year. Um, with overachieving, now all of a sudden, you know, Felino's gone. They – they trade Dubois, you know, line A's underachieved a little bit. So, yeah, I don't know. It's fucking tough sledding there, and uh, and somebody's got to pay the piper. Uh, we're going to get to Marty St. Pierre in a second. Uh, first off, which part of your house feels a little less secure than you might want? Maybe it's your first floor windows. Maybe a French door. For me, it used to be my sliding glass door. You don't want somebody creeping through that. But I never have to worry about that now because of my security system from Simply Safe. Now, there's no time, day or night, where I have to worry because I know my house is always being guarded. Even if you already feel safe, that might not be true of everyone, everyone in your home. If you've never had a conversation about that, it's honestly not a bad thing to do. It just feels really good to be able to press the home button on my Simply Safe keypad and hear the bass say, alarm on, and know that if anyone did try to come in, the alarm would go off. Simply Safe calls the authorities, hooks it up, and speaking of hooking it up, it's so easy to do. I've said before, I don't even own a toolbox. This thing was so easy for me to hook up. You can do it in probably 15 minutes. The thing is, Simply Safe just makes it so easy. 
It takes about two minutes to customize the system on their website, simplysafe.com slash chicklets. The system arrives in about seven days and it takes 30 minutes to set up. Like I said, I did it myself. It's super easy. If I can do it, you can do it. So go to simplysafe.com slash chicklets today to customize your system and get a free security camera. You also get a 60-day risk-free trial, so there's nothing to lose. That's simplysafe.com slash chicklets. That's S-I-M-P-L-I-S-A-F-E dot com slash chicklets, C-H-I-C-L-E-T-S. Check them out. Keep the homestead safe. And now we're going to send it over to Martin St. Pierre. It's time to bring on our next guest. Well, despite not being drafted, this forward recently retired after a 17-season pro hockey career that included stints with the Blackhawks, Bruins, Senators, and Canadians. He also played several seasons in the KHL and had pitch tops in Austria, Switzerland, the UK, Finland, Slovakia, and Hungary. Well-traveled man. Thanks so much for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Martin St. Pierre. How you doing, my friend? Good. Thanks for having me, boys. Our pleasure. When did you get back to uh, North America? I got back uh, early March. Uh, our season was cut short due to the COVID restrictions, so flew back to Canada, sold my place in Arizona, so I'm uh, going to reside here for a little bit, but had to do the two-week quarantine and the uh, mandatory three-night stay in the hotel, so that was pretty uh, pretty painful, but I've been out for a week, so trying to enjoy the weather, but it's still pretty strong here, the COVID, so it's all uh, full lockdown. You had to sell all. Uh, you had to sell your property here to pay off your your tabs in Old Town. Absolutely. <laughs> Last Mom. time I saw you, you were the drunkest guy in Old Town. The one Absolutely. night. Absolutely, you got to go big or go home, right? <laughs> we've actually had some. We, we, we've I've had some of my biggest nights with this guy. We did F one race together yeah. in Montreal. We were there for four days. Uh, we did a Bruckheimer hockey tournament. Which, oh, yeah. Bruckheimer, the Bruck. <laughs> we talk about it, but I think we had to sign an NDA. So maybe we could squeak out a few stories. And yeah. Then, and then well, party with you and G one time in Ottawa as well. Yeah. So uh, where do we start? The F1. Uh, I, I think I've been there five, six times before. And then I think you kind of got a, you got the, the wind of things that uh, I think you brought Kami and uh, Boy Gordon. Oh, my God. Teddy and, uh, oh, let's, my. Let's start. Teddy Purcell, t- too. Hey, tell, tell them the Cirque du Soleil story. Yeah, so G, uh, so that was a Saturday, and I'd never been to Cirque du Soleil before, and G says, uh, hey, boys, I think Max Talbot was there, uh, G Snacks, and a couple of the guys. My brother was there, too. He goes, uh, my assistant got us six tickets to the Cirque du Soleil. Would you guys want to go? And, I mean, three-day banner, like, you know, might as well. Uh, so it's, uh, let's say Saturday at noon. So he's like, meet at the VIP tent um and nobody was there so we showed up late but we're at the beer tent so double fisting and all that stuff and the chaperone kind of comes and brings us down and i it's it's a tent so there might have been three thousand people and there's six seats left and it's all the way down front row and it's like you can hear a pin drop and here here, here are these six guys absolutely crushed two full beers in each other's hand in each hand going down the stairs sitting down and everybody recognized g biz uh you know and so on um his so, love that oh oh it was buddy. awesome was he's like yeah what's up boys yeah, yeah they, like, shut the fuck up yeah exactly but here's the kicker so halfway through the show they kind of put like the gymnasts or whatever they go up and down the uh the aisles from up top and uh they're mixing the show all these like flamboyant things and then my brother is kind of like on the side and he gets a paper dropped on his, on his, uh, on his lap. He was like, what the heck's going on while the show is going. And it was an, it was a piece of paper with a bunch of numbers on it. So the gymnasts, I guess there's two groups and they're rotating in between the back, they're taking a rest. And then the second group goes on stage. Well, the first group gave all their numbers and they recognized the hockey guys, the front row. So they were texting in the back while the show was going on <laughs> to my brother. I mean, like, I've never seen anything like it. That was, that topped it off. I mean, that was the golden ticket right that there. That was the golden ticket. Nothing ever happened. I mean, they were doing shows for six months straight, but um, we've had some good nights. I mean, with G, uh, the one that pops up in my head was uh, there's a big uh, music festival. It's called Blues Fest in Ottawa. And um, <clears throat> I think uh, Theory of a Dead Man was coming in to open for this big dog that was coming in on the Friday evening. And uh, the Thursday night we were going out and I think G and I lived in the same building for I don't know, six or seven years. This was a single days and in his prime kind of thing. And this is Claude Giroux, by the Claude way, Giroux, for anybody sorry, who's yeah. wondering. And uh, yeah, so the Thursday we meet up at the same bar and these, uh, I think it was the singer and the, the drummer from Theory of the Dead Man. And 
they uh, they challenged G to uh, to drinking contests. So needless to say, they were opening, like I said, on the Friday, and uh, they did not make their they did not make their show. So Get G the buried fuck them. out of here. G absolutely buried them. So there's no opener <laughs> for the big band. But I forgot to mention that Montreal a week after when I came back to Ottawa, I go on Instagram and I see pictures of Biz and Mike Commodore still in Montreal. And I'm like, what are you boys still doing there? We, we, so that was, I ended up changing my flight twice. We, I think I left on Tuesday. It was uh, from, from F1 race. And then I was on, yeah, I was on the IR for a few weeks. But but I, I constantly say it on this podcast. If there's one thing you have to experience, especially for like a bachelor party or something like that type, you, you gotta go. go 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 and do it. Go, go from like a Thursday and then leave Monday. Well, try to leave Sunday if you can, but I, I don't think you'll be able to because Sunday is one of the funner days because then it's all over, right? But uh, we, we yeah we had some uh, some great wow. days together. That's for sure. Wow. It was good times. That was when New City Gas opened for the first time, and David oh. Guetta was playing on yeah. a Saturday night. But we had Boyd Gordon, Derek Brassard meant us. We had we had our own hockey team at, at New City Gas. Boys are <laughs> boys are so crushed that usually the DJ will go on at one o'clock. Um, and by I think I had a buddy that came, turned over to me. He's like, "Hey, like I don't know, David Guetta's David Guetta's on." He's like, "When's David Guetta coming on?" And I'm like, "Man, he just played his last song. It's about four o'clock in the morning. It's time to pack it in." <laughs> yeah, time for the after hours, dude. The sun's coming up. It's, exactly. he, he already played. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. A lot of good now, times. Now you were born in Ottawa, right? Yeah, born and raised in Ottawa. Uh, French guy, uh, the east part of Ottawa. And then uh, I could barely speak a lick of English until I was 13 or 14. Uh, I just learned English as a second language through minor hockey. And uh, the best thing that happened to me was when I was, uh, I went to Guelph for four years. It was all English and just got thrown into the wolf pack and learned quick. So that was a uh, blessing in disguise, I guess. I was going to ask, like, was it almost disappointing? You said it was a great thing, but were you, were, were you wanting to play in the Quebec league just because you spoke French? Were you like, actually, no, the OHL might be considered better. I'm willing to go there. I would have loved to, but the thing was, is I'm on the Ontario side. No, no, I know. That's why I'm saying it's yeah, just like, I, yeah, no, absolutely. As far as the language, I mean, yeah. Nothing you can do, right? You'd have to have like family in Quebec, I'm guessing. I think so. I think you have, someone has to reside or you have to place a midget or I don't know the exact rule, but I mean, yeah. It would have been awesome to play Gatineau Olympics. Uh, they're literally five minutes from downtown Ottawa, just across the bridge. But, um, but needless to say, I had a great four years in Guelph and some good times. But yeah, I was I think I was drafted 16th round, so it was kind of very very late addition to to my junior career. Well, you played there. I mean, I mean, your last year, you guys had a ton of success. I think you guys ended up winning the OHL. But like when you first got there, like, like I, I know you're a little bit undersized. Were, were, did you fit right in? Did you have to play on the depth lines? Like, how did it all work out? Um, we were pretty stacked. So I got there in 2000. Uh, we hosted the Mem Cup in 2002, and we absolutely got rinsed. Uh, I think it was Kootenai, like the Stoll, Dawes, and all those guys. Um, so my first couple of years, like you said, I, and I was always stamped. And I, obviously, I've never got drafted in the NHL, and I was still – whether I was 17 or 20 coming to pro is I didn't have that fifth gear, my speed uh, with my short size or my size, obviously. Um, so it was tough for first couple of years, but after that, I kind of got the wind of it and I had some good players. I got lucky. Uh, my second and third year, I was to play in with Dan Paye and Dustin Brown. Um, I mean, how can you not put up the points with those guys? And then my last year, I was playing, I think I talked to you earlier, Biz, I was playing, our power play was Kevin Klein, Dan Girardi, Ryan Callahan. We had a Brett Trudell's in front of the net, but uh, he went to school after, but our power play is absolutely deadly. Um, and then we ended up getting Cam Jansen at the, uh, at the trading deadline to kind of solidify. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> he was playing guy. power play? He was not playing the power play, but he ended up being in my line mate because Dustin went, Dustin Brown ended up going to LA as an 18-year-old. Um, but here's a story about Cam. So I, I never met, obviously he was in Windsor before tough guy. And, uh, he came in the locker room and he had this white under armor skin tight, you know, um, gitch Jack, absolute chiseled. And, uh, obviously he's pretty intimidating. So he was playing with me and Callie and, uh, he basically told us, he's like, I don't want the puck on the breakout. I don't want the puck in the neutral zone. He's like, when you get it, don't even look at me, dump it in my corner. And he was so heavy, so intimidating. Either he'd crush the guy or he'd miss the guy completely. But the sound that he'd make on the board was 
as intimidating as the hit. So the next time we do that, these kids were, they're scared. I mean, we had so much success. He created so much space. We used to say I was the toughest guy on the ice with, with Cam. So <laughs> oh, you're, 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 just out, you're spearing guys. You're doing whatever you wanted. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, no, he definitely helped us. That was, uh, that was a great four years, but, uh, it goes by quick junior days, uh, four years in a heartbeat. Your guys last year, did you guys win the OHL? Yeah, correct. Sorry. So we won the OHL and then we went to the Mem Cup in uh, Kelowna and then uh, we got spanked there too. We, it's a long season for junior, right? And from September to May long weekend. Um, and we just, uh, yeah, we just didn't have success, but uh, I had some good years, but uh, lots of good memories there, but yeah. So uh, we'll take the OHL championship for that. So you mentioned like, you, you know, very good junior career, you're undrafted in the NHL and like, what was your next step? I mean, how did you how did you get that first contract? I know you spent a year in the coast, but coming out of junior, were you were you kind of panicked for a little bit, or did you figure you were going to get something? So my last year is a big race uh, between me and Corey Perry and all the the big guys, the big drafted guys from London. Um, and obviously, I never got drafted, so I was a free agent, and that was so I had uh, 110 points in junior, uh, the Wayne Gretzky playoff MVP, like everything was going for me, and I was feeling good, obviously won the OHL championship and then the lockout happened. So horrible timing. And I had a Canadian school package in my contract. So I went to Dalhousie in Halifax in Canada for, uh, for that summer. Uh, I lasted five weeks and, uh, it just wasn't, I mean, I give credit to, you know, guys that went that, that go to school and then went to school, but I just wasn't ready mentally. And then I got a call from, uh, Jeff Ward, who was the coach in Edmonton and they put a AHL team during the lockout in Edmonton, the called the Edmonton Roadrunners, And they had the, uh, the spot number 50 on the, for the training camp. So he said, uh, do you want to come and try out? And I packed my bags. And if I was to be on that exhibition game pro, I would lose my school package kind of like in the States, how they used to do. So went there, had a good camp, signed a two year deal there. And that's, that's when I kind of bounced in between uh, the East coast and, and the AHL, and then that team was done after the first lockout, and then I kind of got uh, tossed around to, to Norfolk, and that's how I began my uh, pro career. Hey, you must have been having some fun in Edmonton because that you said that it was a lockout year. Like Stoll was there, Torres was there, and those guys had already played in the NHL, right? Correct, yeah. They sent uh, Rashi down. They sent Jarrett <laughs> Jared down. Uh, I was living at the hotel at the Sun Place Hotel, the old Sun Place uh, oh, so man. yeah, I've, uh, I've given that place a lot of shit. Uh, <laughs> the one star oh, tough spot. <laughs> it's a half star, but I mean, uh, and yeah, those two guys, uh, they would pick me up every morning, uh, to and from the rink. And, uh, they definitely showed me the ropes, how to, to be a professional hockey player <laughs> on and off the ice. Torres says he would wheel up to the bar and he would literally chuck his keys in the air and they, <laughs> anything, to the man, VIP, like, he would throw them as high as he could. In anything the air and, like, I think, uh, Stoli broke his leg. Uh, I want to say during the, obviously during the season, I don't know if it was before or after Christmas and we'd go to Cowboys and. I mean, he had like 10 nurses at the club, but just <laughs> whatever he wanted. It was, uh, it's actually pretty mind boggling. It's fascinating to say the least, but yeah, those two guys, like I said, definitely showed me how to, to be a professional hockey player. <laughs> you, you, you played in the coast that year too, in, in, uh, in Greenville. Yeah. Played in Greenville. So. Well, I was going to ask, like, was that the scourging when you ended up getting sent down there or did you have to start there? I had to, uh, yeah, from camp, I got sent down there to Greenville, South Carolina, and I had 45 games. And that year in Edmonton, I think they lost like 18 in a row. Um, they didn't, uh, we had a good team on paper. We just couldn't, uh, just couldn't win. So I had, I was playing pretty well in Greenville, and then they called me up. Um, and then a couple of their first rounders, like two Finnish guys got hurt. So I ended up kind of filling their spot. Uh, finished, uh, finished his, uh, my stint there really well, but I went d- back down to Greenville for the playoffs. Um, so kind of draft picks, contracts kind of got involved, but I had a great time in Greenville. I mean, South Carolina is a, is a great state, uh, but I'm kind of glad I got to experience the East coast to, to say the least. I mean, we played in uh, Pensacola, those 10 hour bus trips. There's nothing better. I mean, we had the sleeper going to get the wine and, you know, you can sleep 18 guys in the back. There's nothing like it. Right. So, um, say whatever you want about the East coast. I had a great time. Um, and there's a lot of players that great players that come out of it. So yeah, start at the bottom and work your way up kind of thing. Yeah. Right? Wit never had to play there. No, 
No, I got, the, I, got lucky. I got lucky biz. I, I was drafted really high and then didn't act like a piece of shit off the ice. Like you to get sent down. <laughs> hey, but I think for people who played against you, they know this, but many people don't. And that is that you used a stick that was taller than you. And I think everyone yeah. right away, like playing against you, I was like, Oh my God, that guy's stick is insane. Like, how did you begin at what age did you begin to use a stick that was just way too big for you? You just got so comfortable, I'm guessing. Yeah, so it was in uh, it was in junior, and I think back then it was the those yellow uh, synergies came out, uh, but I was using the synthesis, so it was like the blade and the shaft that was inserted like right at the at the heel, and it was a different line. I kept making it longer and longer and longer, and I mean that lasted my whole third year of junior, so oh, two or three, and the next thing you know my stick was literally taller than me. So it was extremely tall, uh, but I had success. I mean, don't ask me to go one-on-one or cycle the puck in the corner, but I mean, I could do other things and it kind of compensated. Um, but that was a thing when I went to Edmonton, uh, when I got there to camp, uh, the, the first morning I had a black line on my knob all the way through across my four sticks. I'm like, what's going on here? And the trainer came, he's like, listen, he's like, you're, kind of in the big leagues now there's rules and restrictions he's like your stick can't be uh taller than 63 inches so basically from the heel all the way up um and mine was like 65 or something ridiculous <laughs> and he's like in the nhl there's only i think four or five exceptions i think like al mckinnis chara and like pronger and all those guys so who am i who am i to you know, have a long stick. So I you're to like, I'm already St. Pierre, bud. You got 14 <laughs> pairs of socks on. You're like, do I, do I make it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, got, you walk in in stilts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, on tippy toes, but I had to cut it down. And then that's one of the things when I got to Boston, um, Z, I think stick was 66 or some ridiculous. And mine was 63 and a half. So I kind of gave myself an extra inch, but um you have to say at least so when him and i there's a picture on google it's him and i beside each other i think i sent to you biz earlier um you know he's at least a foot and a half taller than me but my stick was literally an inch or a couple inches uh shorter than him but i think he used like 130 flex um and i grabbed it when i was there at training camp i'm like this thing's a steel rod you know what i mean it's a uh, crazy stuff obviously he's got a lot of weight to put on it but that's how tall the stick was yeah do you ever have a coach who like was like dude cut it it's too long. Yeah. There's some guys, like I said, um, at towards the end, when you, when you start being a prospect and then you turn into suspect. To a suspect, right. <laughs> um, at some point I kind of hit, obviously you get some up and downs and, um, ups and downs. And uh, a couple coaches are like, you know, I like when I was in my downs, uh, they'd be like, maybe you should do something about your stick. But then next week I'd get on fire and they're like, you know what? Don't change anything. Um, what happened was when I went to Europe, and I mean, there's literally, there's obviously, as you know, with in, in Russia, there's no dumping, um, you know, you dump the puck, you're getting benched. So, um, then I kind of had to, you know, you get a regroup five times and not dump the puck to get in. And that's when I kind of had an issue with my long stick. Um, and then one morning I was in a slump and I just cut it five and a half inches, which became normal, uh, as the normal length as anybody would use. Uh, and I've been u- using that since then, since uh, this past season. So I was going to ask, it, it, were you getting jammed up a lot? Like on yeah. the boards and stuff? Yeah. Like that's... I never went in corners. <laughs> oh, yeah. Killed. That's how you solve the problem? <laughs> exactly. I just get the... Yeah. I have a genius idea how this yeah. will work. Yeah, exactly. Someone else go grind the corners. You're like the bubble the hockey point. guy with a yeah. long stick. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Up and down, left and right, but not too close to the boards. <laughs> used to say my stick would last pretty long, so not grinding on the boards. Matt, you also played in the 1997 Quebec Pee Wee tourney like Whitney. Did you have any recollections going head to head with him at all? Uh, I don't know if, I, if we played against what each other. What team were you we on? Were, uh, you know what? We uh, we got denied in the um, in the uh, division where you're sponsored by NHL, NHL teams, and we were in the international division. I think we played this Russian team who got absolutely spanked. Um, that was the I, team that ended up getting in the fight, and then they they probably would have dusted us but probably we're the champions because yeah. of it but, they were uh, nasty they were filthy um but i remember uh you were walking in the rink and you're signing autographs i mean you're <laughs> treated like a rock star and that was <laughs> definitely uh i don't remember that much of it but i remember it was snowing you're at the college city quebec uh you know you have 10 15 000 fans watching you and definitely a great memory for 
playing peewee, right? Oh, it was the best. And then when you go to your first full year in the AHL with Norfolk, I mean, you light it up. Point per game guy. And Chicago was horrible that year. Yeah. I, I, you got two games, but were you kind of surprised you didn't get get a little bigger chance there? The, I think the first year was more like getting my feet wet in the league. Um, yeah. Obviously, my points, you know, playing the power, playing the style I played, the points were coming. Um, it was just a matter of, you know, learning the ins and outs and playing defensively and all that stuff. So I, they gave me the two games. Um, and then the second year, that's when, um, that was one of my peak as far as my career, because that team, we had probably eight, nine guys that two years after won the Stanley cup, you know, from junior and you go and from like, I was, my wingers were Peronto, P.A. Peronto and Troy Brower and before Bachansky got traded. Um, you know, and then we got Bruce uh, you're going like Bickle, Frazier, Burrish, yeah. uh, Buff, Crawford. I mean, damn, our, our HL was stacked. I think Keith was there. Me, Duncan Keith was there too. Duncan Keith, but that year that my second year, he ended up going up him, Seabrook, uh, Vandermeer, all those guys went up to Chicago. So my second year was Kane and Taze's first year. Um, so that was nice to see guys, you know, uh, getting the chance to stick in there while at the same time seeing a young Jonathan Tate as a young Patrick Kane, you know, Duncan Keith kind of just starting his NHL career and guys just blooming after that. So that's an example of, you know, you, you're, you're within an organization watching it become like a, a dynasty in a way with their three cups. So there's many coaches that, that affect these guys. And, and I think one of them's Trent Yanni, right? He was down yep. in the head coach in Norfolk. Yeah, Trent Yanni was uh, my f- – the year before I came, he was in Norfolk. And then my first uh, year when I got to Norfolk, 05, 06, he was up in Chicago. And then he got let go and Denny Savard took over. Um, so then that's when I kind of got a few games up. Um, they, and we had kind of an older team. And, and by that time, they I think it was for eight years in a row, they didn't make playoffs. So for me to get a stint there was like, wow, this is the NHL, but holy – yeah, you know, this is not shit, a great team. Miserable. I mean, like, <laughs> it sucks. But I mean, the guys had good spirits, and you had the older guys like Adrian O'Coin, um, you know, Colin Moore, Marty Lapointe, you know, all those guys. So they made they made the experience better. But yeah, there's nothing like uh, not making the playoffs for eight years, right? Marty, when you signed with Chicago as a free agent after going undrafted, was that like a huge sense of accomplishment for you? You know, we like I said, you didn't get drafted, but now you're with an NHL squad. Yeah. Um, even my first game, uh, when I got called up and then I was going right to Dallas, um, growing up, I was always told, you know, you're the short guy, you're never going to make junior. And then I had a pretty successful career in junior and then not being drafted was, you know, you kind of grow out of it and realize, you know, it might be a better opportunity that you get to pick your, not pick your team, but maybe a different opportunity arises in a different organization. And that kind of what, that's kind of what happened to me. So when I ended up going to Chicago, it was kind of, Blessing in disguise, but I mean, I definitely worked hard and, and had a lot of ups and downs, but um, that definitely a dream come true to get there. Uh, but with guys like my statue and, uh, you know, the small stature and it's hard to stick there. So it's one thing making it, but then you have to work extra hard to, you know, to stay there. So um, the work was, uh, there's a lot of work in front of me to stay there. Uh, I want to go back to Norfolk, one of the most underrated AHL cities to live in. Yeah, You guys must have been having a ball off the ice. And another guy, I don't know if we mentioned him yet, Bufflin was there as well. Correct, yeah. So, oh yeah. So the first year I lived at the beach in Virginia Beach with uh, Wisniewski. And then the second year I lived downtown with Bolin. And all those guys, the Wisco guys like Burrish, uh, Skilly, Dowell, they came in after their season. Um, and I mean, we had a blast. And uh, so half the guys live in Virginia Beach, half the guys live downtown. But um, it, during then, I think we were allowed four and five. So you'd be playing Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday afternoon. But teams that would come to us, we would spank them on the Friday night. And then they would go out and then spank us on the Saturday night because then we would go out this Friday night, right? But um, Buff, I mean, he was an absolute animal. He, was, uh, he came in as a D. And I mean, he was heavy, but he's probably one of the, like ath- the best athlete I've seen. He's fast. He's strong. He's got a six shot. Um, he was so heavy that they sent a nutritionist down from Blackhawks, put him on a, uh, uh, healthy nutrition plan. And I think that lasted maybe five days. I think he was eating salads. I think he lost a couple pounds and you can honestly notice it on the ice. Like he, 
whether he lost a couple pounds, you'd be like, this guy's not the same. Like he's, you know, he's not buff. So they just said, screw it. Like do your thing, man. Just be buff. And then, uh, obviously it's success. And then when he got to Chicago, I mean, what other player can be a defenseman in the minor leagues and then go up to Chicago, play as a forward, win the Stanley cup, and then put back on D. I mean, it's just. Brent Burns is like buff. the only other guy I could think of that had a, a career like that, where it was Correct. just like whatever position you could put yeah. him in. He's to have they success. just said, do your thing, man. And I mean, his shot was the same in the AHL and. I mean, you have guys like turning pro in 1920 and trying to block those shots. I mean, that's pretty intimidating. So he, uh, well-deserved career. I mean, he worked hard, but, uh, what a specimen. Marty, after Chicago, you end up signing here in Boston with the Bruins organization. It was very similar, I guess, a, a team on the rise just a couple of years before their first Stanley Cup in several years. What was your experience like there? And also I want you to talk about Providence. Is that the best AHL city out there? It's up there. I mean, I love Providence. I love Boston. It's one hour away. I mean, I didn't realize the, uh, it was my first time on the East coast as far as North Northeast. Um, and again, like for me, um, my first stint was in Chicago. My second one was in, in Boston. The reason is, is that my, my one season in, in Providence, uh, it was Tuca, it was, uh, Boychuk, McQuaid and Brad Marchand's first year. So again, like you said, two years later, they ended up winning the Stanley Cup. So if I was to look back and see the times that we had in the minor leagues and the development and the hard work, see them flourish as, as players was, uh, was pretty gratifying. But um, great times, you know, the Boston Garden was, uh, uh, not the Boston Garden, the Tea Bank or whatever it's called now. <laughs> What's it called? I still I, call T- it the Boston TD Garden. TD Garden, yeah, everybody TD calls Garden. it. TD Garden, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, no, oh, that was that was a great time, and we ended up going to the conference finals in um, during that season. So we didn't get to to be uh, to black case, but uh, there's some good stories about uh, you know I, the year I got call- the, that year I got called up to uh, to Boston is when Bergeron got that concussion. Uh, I think it was against Philly at home, and uh, yeah, Randy Jones hit him exactly. So I was at that game, and then my phone rang. So usually that year is me and Sabaka, that uh, Vladimir Sabaka, they were getting called up, up and down, uh, to play with Sean Thornton on the fourth line. So we had the <laughs> the, the the shortest and toughest uh, fourth line, but um, well, we had some good times. And then I ended up taking Bergeron's seat on the plane. So my first experience with uh, was Dan O'Chara was getting on the plane, and he was all the way the farthest back on the left, but he was in aisle in the aisle seat, and I got in Bergeron's seat, which was right, right in front of him, and kind of got comfortable. I put my seat back and I felt like his knees right in like <laughs> digging in my back. And, and I, then you're on I waivers. On, yeah, basically. And I get a tap on my shoulder and you know, him in his Slovakian accent is like, uh-uh. he's like, put your seat up, bud. <laughs> so yeah. like, the toilet's yeah. back there. So we exactly. saved your spot. So my seat was, was uh, pretty 90 degrees for, it, you know, as long as the fight was and suck it. <laughs> were, you was on that, a, were you on that Providence team that, uh, where Tuca had the complete meltdown. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, That's just an all time. It was a shootout, right? It was a shootout. So there's two, my two highlights on my season in Providence was Marshy. So Peter Schaefer, the older guys on the team was, were Peter Schaefer and Jeremy reach. And uh, they both got sent down to Boston and uh, they had the best attitude. Absolute beauties. Those two guys. I love those guys, but we were on the bench and Marshy for some reason was on the ice. It was Worcester at home and he scores his first AHL goal. And he goes from the far end all the way to the red line, stops, faces the bench, and gives it the old Hulk Hogan to the oh bench. My shit. And I have Jeremy Reach and Peter Schaefer beside me, and they're like, oh, my God, <laughs> right? And he gives them one of these. We're like, oh, fuck. But the other story was, uh, yeah, Tuca in the shootouts. I think what happened was the first one uh, went in, and they waved it off. So right away, he was flustered. He was losing his mind. I mean, not losing his mind, but as far as the rep making the wrong call. And then it was a do or die, and they were going down. So you save it, we win. Uh, you know, they score, we lose. And he saved it, and he called it a goal, and he just flipped. They absolutely lost it. And then trainer, I think on the clip, the trainer opened the door, but there's like a milk crate or whatever. We put yeah, the no. pucks in, and we just launched it. I mean – absolutely losing it but if i remember correctly by the time the last guys were on the ice we got in the room he was basically like smirking like okay i took it a little too far like you know it's not every day that you see a milk curtain fucking going on the ice he had, but, a, bla- he had a blackout moment exactly no yeah but what a beauty. 
Jeremy so, Reach. That was my first AHL fight with in Wilkes-Barre. Really? Jeremy was it a, was he was it a square a, off or was it, was it a, a square uh, off? And he was a tough customer. Yeah, he too, was a wasn't tough he? Prick. Western boy. Yeah, he a was. A, he, and he looked. He looked so mean and mad on the ice. He had like a yeah. CCM bucket from like the fucking fourteenth, fourteenth hundreds. Is that what it says? Fourteen hundreds. So you grind it out and you do get a chance in the NHL with Boston for a little bit. But every time you go to the AHL, it's really similar, I think, to Chris Bork and that you guys were it was like you were too good for the AHL and then couldn't really ever stick in, in the NHL. And at some point you said, let's go over to Europe and kind of make as much money as I can. Yeah. So my last my one stint with well, my two stints during the season with Boston was uh, last game was in Toronto was the all star break. That was my game number nine. Then back then, if you played 10 games, you had to stick there for 30 days. Um, and Claude Julien was our coach. I scored in shootouts. We win the game. And uh, Toronto Auto was a four-hour drive. So to me, I was like, uh, I think we sc- I scored in, uh, against the Islanders in New York the, the game before. So I'm like, uh, I think I'm going to stick. You know, Bergeron still hurt. Uh, Peter Shirelli, you know when you sit, when you get called up and you're in the room and you see the – the team manager that like, rolls around and he's just, he's got the awkward face and you know, he's just beaming for you, saying you down. I'm like, no you way. You start running. You're, you're just like, you're, oh. you're underneath your stall. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And he's like, Hey, uh, Peter wants to see you. I'm like, does no way. But uh, he's like, Hey, we're going to send you down, but we're going to call you right back up after the, uh, the all-star break. And that would have been my game 10. And I never got a sniff after. So, but we ended up going to the conference finals against Hershey. And then we got, uh, we got beat, but, um, yeah. So then I got a, at that time I was like, maybe it's time for me to take, uh, my career to Europe and I got a pretty good offer in Russia. And, uh, that was my first stint with, uh, with the Russian coaches in Russia with, uh, you have to keep it. Was That's my where Stapleton with. was and Hennessy. Yeah. 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 So we had, uh, that was definitely an eye opener. So that was my first stint. It was 2010. Um, I had a first in 2007 when it was the last year in the Russian Super League, but I was there for, I think, 14 games. And I lasted three months. And I came back. I was like, I'm not ready. They threw a bunch of money. And I was like, you know, screw this. And I went back to when Norfolk changed to Rockford. Um, but that team I met in Latvia, and it was Vladimir Krikunov, who is now the most legendary Russian coach still alive after Tikhanov that passed away a few years ago. Um best story for me is we got there we're in the hotel i still haven't learned now i can speak a little bit of russian i can get around and order uh, like understand more but uh the beach is had to be 10 miles and 10 miles long it was an absolute ginormous beach and uh the first morning we get a knock on our door it's the again the team leader or whatever and he's yelling in russian shorts just shorts in lobby 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 so we get down there me and my roommate get on the bus and even the Russians were, you know, what's going on. We drive and the road was parallel to the beach all the way down. And uh, basically he yells in Russian has a stopwatch. And he's like, you guys got one hour to get back. So everybody like, and I mean, they're booking it on the beach. We run for 10 miles and we had to do it under an hour. And we made it like 57, 58, just like, what is going on here? You know, the lactic acid, my legs, my legs were double the size. I couldn't feel my legs that night. And then next morning we get another knock on the door. Same thing. Oh. When I say I was hurting, I was hurting, but you just had to go and you just wing it. And you couldn't even see the end of the, like the end of the beach and just, so we did that. Everybody made it a couple. I think a couple of guys didn't make it. And then the third day uh, I heard about this coach, which was like just the old, like the USSR Soviet back in the eighties, uh, him and his training off the ice, but guys would have to do, you know, you're facing me, you come, you hop in, you hop up, you straddle your legs and you're doing setups on me kind of thing while I'm standing, just like stuff like that body weight stuff. You're just like, you know, it's 2010, like this, not, this shouldn't be going on, but get on the ice and see these big uh, tires, tractor tires. And there's like a, you know, when you, you run parachutes, like the, the rope that's kind of, you know, tied to it, but it's tied to the, 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 the tire that's what's going on and i had two swedish guys uh went, you probably remember daniel fernholm back in wilkesburg i played with him yeah yes Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Pick. 
So I was stuck with him and another Swede, probably just around his size. And he, he's 215, right? Right. He's at least. Big, and, and a, and a 10 guy. pound chew pack in his lip. <laughs> and uh, basically you had to go from goal line to goal line 12 times. You had to go six down and you had to go three down and back with the two guys on the tire. And I'm maybe a buck 85 then. And I think by the fourth down, I ended up puking everywhere. But that was. They start you know, cheering. Groups. They're like, yeah. I mean, like, oh, there's a few guys that puked, and it was just, it was just one of those. And that was the whole mentality. So that was my first real uh, experience as far as Russia. And, and then uh, that was your last training camp. That was your last sign. You would always sign when training camps were over. That's a smart way to go. But he was, uh, he was so old school that in the exhibition games, we're going on the ice for warm up. And, um, you know, you're used to just skating around, shooting a half circle and all that stuff. And I hear a whistle, I'm like, and all our, the whole team starts skating around in circles. I'm like, what's going on? But it's him. He's on the bench while we pre and warm up and he's making guys sprint. So he's whistling and he had to sprint for five seconds. And I think we had to do like five of them and then you have to warm up. So you're like, uh, he's still very old school, but then he's the type of coach that during the game, He's not behind you. He's in front of you. So he's walking basically where the water bottles, but he's facing you. So you come off the ice, he's just blasting you, but he's not seeing the play. So if, I mean, I don't know how you can get hit by pucks more often, but if the guy's making a nice play, he, he can't see that. He's just turning around and he's just blasting you. So he's walking basically where we spit. Um, just in, <laughs> just old school, but now I can laugh at it. It's just a great experience, right? Buddy, that, that first year overseas, I want to ask, I'm going on ho- off hockey DB. I know sometimes they're not accurate. Did you play in Finland, Austria, and the KHL all within that few months span? Yeah. So that was, uh, that was my suitcase year, to say the least. <laughs> uh, I lasted three. Uh, I didn't have a good, it was very miserable there. I didn't, I, now I look back, I could have probably handled it better, but uh, they bought me out after three months and ended up going to Finland and the team, which is a great organization, but I was a five hour drive for the Arctic circle all the way North of Finland. Uh, basically from the Santa Claus village. Um, very dark. We had two hours of sunlight a day. Um, just, I lasted three months and I said, you know, I get me out of here and uh, ended up finishing the season. The last three months of that for uh, Red Bull Salzburg with uh, the legendary Pierre Paget. Well, did you get like the press when you were playing in Russia, just given like you're going and, you know, doing what you got to do at the rink and then you come back and there's base, you don't have any friends, no socializing. And well, yeah, we had, um, we had to stay at, at the Baza cause he was old school. So we had our apartments, but I, I was single. I had a hockey bag and a, another hockey bag full of clothes, but we had to stay at the Baza and you had to report at the Baza the night before a game at eight o'clock. Cause we had tea meal. Then you had a video room. And then you had to sleep there and then you bust together at the rink, bust back, pregame nap, pregame meal, pregame nap, and then go to the game. So basically, and you play every second or third day. So basically the only time you have at home is the night after the home game, if you're not flying out. So to me, it was just a complete drastic change in, in as far as a culture. Uh, but needless to say, I ended up playing six years there. So I got used to it, but just right away within a couple of months, you're like, what am I doing here? You know, not speaking the language. I couldn't read by then. And, um, but, I mean, I had the best years there. So, But it was definitely hard for sure. Yeah, but you ended up back in North America. Was it a, was it a problem getting a contract then for the with 11-12 season with Springfield? No, uh, not that it was hard. It was just a matter of, like I said earlier, you went from a prospect to a suspect. So now it wasn't like I was looking for a one-way NHL deal. It was more like, I was more like a veteran in the AHL and trying to now somewhat try to teach what I've learned in my first few years to teach the young guys on and off the ice, I guess. But, um, well, then I went to Springfield and then, uh, that was a good year. Again, I had young Cam Atkinson, I had uh, David Savard. We had Manny legacy and that came back. Uh, I don't know how old he was, but he was an absolute stud. Um, and then end up going to, uh, Rockford during the lockout. So it, I, I think my, my status in the AHL was already established, not saying it was easy to get a contract, but it was, it definitely helped to, to come back and, and then also play in Hamilton the year before I left. I was going to say, you got that one game with the Montreal Canadians as a French kid. Was that the highlight of your career or was it suiting up for Ottawa? That was, that was the question. ultimate, that was, no, that was the ultimate highlight. So basically when I grew up, uh, 
I was born in 83. I think the Ottawa Senators came in the league in 1991, if I'm not mistaken. So I grew up as a Montreal Canadian fans. Uh, my dad's still a Montreal Canadian fans, has the, the stickers around his license plate and all that stuff. So, um, but yeah, definitely uh, that was my thing. So that was my 10th year in North America. And I told myself, if I'm going to leave to, to Europe and make a career, I don't want to be looking back and say, could have, should have, would have kind of thing. Yeah. So um, I switched agent and uh, Pat Brisson was my agent. Claude went to Pat Brisson, Claude Giroux. And I told Pat, I said, listen, if you can get me one game in Montreal at home, uh, I'll be forever grateful. So I had uh, obviously with my contract in Hamilton and had some uh, good season there and finally uh, got my crack at it against St. Louis at home. And I think my whole town was there, the whole family and it was pretty, uh, pretty emotional to say the least. And I can still relive the whole warm up and, you know, uh, trying to follow what all those guys are doing, but uh, definitely a, a memory I'll cherish forever, but that was definitely my, the pinnacle of my, uh, my career. Yeah. Guess that Jersey's in a frame somewhere. Absolutely. It's, oh, yeah. it's, it's going to be behind. It's going to be behind them once quarantine. Ends. It's going to be up there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you probably <laughs> lost money with the amount of tickets you had to buy that game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it was, um, yeah, seriously, but no boxes, but, uh, they definitely, uh, they got their own tickets, but definitely for the close family is an expensive night for sure. So then you, you ended up spending a little bit of the time the following year, uh, in Switzerland and, I've always heard how great it is over there. Was that something you kind of looked, I don't know, I could play here the rest of the next eight years and be happy? Or were you looking to the KHL again? Yeah, so I was looking at the KHL and I ended up, uh, I had an okay season in Hamilton, but then you're 30 years old. You want to, and obviously you always want to swing for the fence. So I wanted to get the KHL and there's a team in in, uh, in Croatia and it was called Zagreb Medbichuk and they were in the KHL. It was the sign of three years city, deal. by the way. Unbelievable oh my city. God. Two hours, two and a half hour north from the Croatian coast. I mean, same weather, uh, beautiful city. And Croatia is stunning. Um, and uh, I got an offer there. Uh, it wasn't much, but it was more so to get my feet wet because I already had two stints in Russia and I got bought out. The other one I left. So you kind of want to reestablish your... Uh, your, your character and, and your persona as far as what they see, because GMs in Russia, they literally go on elite prospect and that's their scouting report. Right. So got there and we had, uh, there's no import rule in Croatia. I think you had to have five Croatian guys, but it was more like they're half and half grandpa as a Croatian. They have their passport. So it's basically an older AHL team in Croatia flying charter and in Russia. And it was the best the best year. And we had, we had some studs and I, I had my best year in six years there as far as point production, just to get my feet wet. And then uh, what they did is because Croatia, as far as sponsors, they don't have a lot of money. Um, so at the end of the season, we had Anthony Stewart, uh, Aaron Pelushai, they sell players to basically pay off their debt. Um, and I was the last one to go. I ended up going to Lausanne in Switzerland uh, for the last three games of the season. And, and uh, we lost to burn in the first round. But like you said, with the, you get there and, it's, you know, it's overwhelming. My dad came to visit and I was able to, you're in the vineyard. So I was able to have lunch in Lausanne by the water, grab a boat, boat an hour. And I was in France and Evian, France, having dinner with my dad. So it was just something out of this world. Right. But uh, I wish I would have spent more time there, but it's definitely a different style of hockey in Switzerland. It's, it's hard. Um, but once you get it, you can make a huge career out of it. But uh, it's a short stint for me there. I, I heard they're so hard on their imports there too in it's, Switzerland. They pay, they pay you have big to bucks. light it up. You have, you to, have light to light it. it if up. you're not if you're not playing well, they're just like, well, we, we paid you to lead the team in scoring. What are you doing? Exactly. You'll play 30 minutes. Um, you lose the game five four and you have four points. Well, it's your fault. Right. <laughs> so it's it's just they want to win, they want to win, they want to win. And you have I think it's five imports, but you can only address four. Uh, so if something yeah, like that, tough. so if they rotate, they put a lot of pressure, but they'll play the shit out of you. So it's up to you to play. And, um, the thing about Europe is you can bounce around too. So they can sell you to the Russian team midway through the season. So a lot of guys bounce around. So, um, there's a lot of pressure. So you just, just got to perform, you know, as much as it's a good lifestyle off the ice. And then I remember playing against Barry's, which is where, I mean, a lot of North Americans have just dominated there. And I think right away of Nigel, jo Nigel Dawes, and he played with like Bochensky and then Kevin Dahlman, the D-man would oh, light man, it up. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. that's K Kazakhstan? Yeah, Kazakhstan, yeah. 
Yeah, I can never say that correctly. Yeah. What, what's what was it like over there? Because Moscow had some great times. People loved it. Was there was the city there pretty nice going out wise dinners? Uh, it's it's, a, it's beautiful. It's yeah. it's cold. It's minus forty degrees Celsius in the winter, and I mean like bone chilling through your parka. Uh, it's freezing cold. Um, so I played with Kevin Dahlman in junior um, in Guelph for my first couple of years. I think he went to Providence after LA or somewhere. And uh, he basically, he's the one that got me there. Um, those years, the two years prior, um, sorry, the year prior that Kevin Dahlman broke uh, Fedosov's record for the most point in the KHL. And I think he had like 56 or if I'm not mistaken, which is ridiculous. As a D-man? As a D-man in the KHL. And I yep, mean, 57, like, 28 goals, 57 yeah. points. When you say D jump in the rush, he was like in front of the net by the time, like he was a stud um, and he was a stud his whole career, but uh, it was him, uh, Mike Lundin, defenseman, uh, Dustin Boyd, Brandon Bachensky and Nigel Dawes. And in Russia, you practice with five guys yeah. and you're the color blue you, you don't switch forwards and D's. So the blue color goes on, you go on, you sit down, you rotate blue colors up and they broke records as far as like a line, putting up the points and they lit it up for two, three years. But as far as the city, um, beautiful. They, I think Russia pull a lot of money into Kazakhstan. There's a lot of oil south of Kazakhstan. There's basically two cities. There's Astana, which is now is called Nursultan because the president resigned and they wanted to change the city to his first name. And then there's Almaty, but it's, it's a mini Vegas, to be honest. Um, but it's cold. Um, there's nothing like Moscow in St. Petersburg, to say the least, <laughs> but uh, it was awesome. I had a great time. Great time. Who was your coach there? Was it Nazarov there? Yeah. So Naz came in. <laughs> Big Naz. fan of the he show. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah. yeah. We're going to get him on soon. <laughs> yeah, you guys should. You know what, Naz, there's mixed reviews. Um, he is a hard ass. He's a big Russian bear. I mean, he had a career in the NHL and he is very well known. He's very well connected. He's buddies with whoever you can think of that's high as far as the presidents and owners and here and there. He's a good guy. He's a, to me, what I saw, he's a completely different guy. If you see him in the hotel lobby waiting for the bus uh, rather than the rink. Uh, but when he was our coach, he had, uh, that line with the five guys and they were playing 30, 35 minutes and they were getting three, four points a game. And again, if we were to lose five, four and they had four points, but it was still their fault. Right. So he was rolling with his big guns and going all in with his big guns. Uh, and we had success, but he was definitely, uh, definitely a hard ass. Um, my name to him was in Russia. If you want to say fuck it's Blet. So he couldn't say St. Pierre. So he was just saying Pierre Blet. So basically, if I screwed it up on the ice, it was just Pierre Blet. So he'd say it so much that my name became Pierre Blet from through the import. They changed the name bar. It's basically, they should have. And he would just call me in and Pierre Blet, let's go. Right. And then it just became an ongoing joke. But um, system wise, he just wanted the tough guys work hard and then just roll with the, the top line. And we had a top line. So that's the thing. We could, we could win games with those guys. And they're definitely a game. Uh, game breaker for uh for us Marty, then you spent some time with uh the kunlun red star that actually located in beijing china what was that experience like playing hockey in china man that must have been a, a culture clash yeah so sure. kazakhstan was this has been a while but i think it was a good five six hour uh flight from moscow uh like a couple hour time change but then you go to shanghai and uh, I remember hearing Brandon Yip on your podcast uh, a few a few months ago, and he was talking about the travel, and that was uh, ridiculous. It definitely took a few years off my life for sure. Um, I want to say it was a 10, 20, 10 to 12 hour flight to Moscow. Uh, so basically leaving Shanghai, we would fly the day before 12 hours, lose six hour, six hour of uh, time difference. And then we would play two and four. And then we would, or we'd play three and six and then literally fly back 12 hours. Um, so basically our day off in Shanghai was the day that we land at eight o'clock in the morning. But I mean, you can only watch so many movies, uh, take, you know, night goal or ambos and a couple of balls of wine and you're still not even there. Um, so teams, when they would come to Shanghai, um, the first night is just like when I was talking about Norfolk, they, they get there, they have nothing. It doesn't matter if you're Ilya Kovalchuk playing for Scott. There's nothing in the tank. So we would definitely uh, 
roast teams the first game, but after that, that's when uh, we had. That was another one where we didn't have imports, so we had a couple of Chinese guys, but most of them were from BC or grandmas. You know, grandma or grandpa has, has some Chinese uh, blood in them, and they get their passports. So it was an older again, older any AHL team um, with uh, Brendan Yip leading the way. So we had a lot of fun, but definitely uh, it was hard. Did definitely you meet hard. Billy? I met Billy, the one that spits the on the Billy the billionaire the spits on his carpet. Is that true? Yeah, I did not meet Billy. Uh, I almost went to the dinner, but those are exclusive dinners with from Billy to to Brendan Yip and his uh, servant assistant. But uh, I ended up uh, going out with uh, Yipper after, and he when he couldn't stop telling the story. He's like, "It's it's, it's mind boggling what he saw at dinner." But um, the guy paid the bills, and you know he did his thing, but. Um, it was crazy. I mean, it, one story we, we had to refuel on the way back from Moscow to uh, Shanghai in Siberia, which was a, I think it was a three or four hour flight from Moscow. And the one trip, the Stewies forgot to go through customs in Moscow. So we fly, we're already three, four hours in, we get to Siberia and we can't get out of the plane because the Stewies didn't go through customs. We had to fly back to Moscow, get them through customs. And that usually takes five minutes, fly all the way back to Siberia, oh. refuel and go all the way back to Shanghai. But the schedule doesn't change. And I think we got in like early afternoon and we had to play that night or some stupid. And it's just, it's a great time. Shanghai is a beautiful city. I highly recommend if you ever get a chance to go to Shanghai, but not for hockey. I mean, our fans, we had maybe 50 fans and they would, they, they're trying to bring hockey in China, which I completely understand for the Olympics and stuff, but they, they didn't know the difference if the home team scored, the visiting team scored. So any goal, any puck that went in fans were cheering, you know, so we didn't really have a, well, a at least you didn't have to run the beach. Yeah, you know, exactly. But uh, no, that was fun. And uh, Alex Kovalev was there as their assistant coach. And I grew up obviously watching Kobe with the Habs. So that was a different experience where he's trying to make us do plays where him and uh, Mary Lemieux were doing with the Pittsburgh Penguins in the 90s when they won the cup. And Blake Kobe, it's not going to work here. <laughs> you when you were in Kazakhstan, were you single the entire time? I was single the entire time. And what are you doing? Like, how are you meeting uh, girls? Were there apps for that then? There are apps, but uh, you go to the grocery store and uh, girls dress up like they're going to the club in New City Gas in Montreal, but they, they go grab milk and cereal. So you can meet and uh, they love Canadians. They, they, they love North Americans. And, and let alone if you're missing a tooth or you get a couple of stitches, you automatically assume that, uh, especially during the winter, there's no soccer as Europeans call it football. So automatically they assume that you were playing hockey, but I definitely had a few dates where um, I had to get on my Google translate before I spoke Russian and uh, she would be on Google translate too, but I'd bring her to a restaurant where we'd go eat like pregame meal. And uh, one time my battery died and her battery died and the uh, servers knew exactly what was happening and I couldn't speak. So it was basically sign language for the rest of the date, oh my. but uh, just Getting different fun experiences table. like that. But yeah. Um, but it's, it, it was fun. Now it's, you can look back and have a good laugh. Hey, was it like, I've, I've talked to guys where they would show up on the road to like different <laughs> hotels and there'd be like 20 hookers in the lobby. Yeah. There's different, uh, different cities that, uh, different, uh, I know like in Belarus or I don't think the teams stay at those hotels anymore, but there's definitely some well, that's a shame. stranglers and, um, it, it can get pretty dangerous, but the guys are usually pretty good. I mean, you always get one or two guys during the t on the team that uh, will let loose. But in uh, in the KHL now with the schedule, it's you're in and out yeah. of the cities. You you charter right after. There's no. Uh, they really did a good job as far as making it as close to as the NHL as you can as far as the travel. Um, on you guys would get breaks though. So where yeah. would you go to? Where where was your spot that you would go with like the other imports? Yeah, so uh, Astana was Astana. So now Nursultan was a six hour flight from Dubai. So that's the thing about Europe is you get three national team breaks. You know, you use this Czech, Russia, Finland, Sweden. They play their three. I think it's in November, December, yeah. and uh, February. So uh, I went to Thailand 
few times. I went to Dubai. Um, you guys want to go to Moscow, but it's definitely uh, it's refreshing to brace the season in, in a third, I guess, or in a half. Um, but yeah, guys go everywhere. Um, but then again, you can't get, you know, especially in Dubai or Thailand, if you go to the full moon party and come back and you have, you know, Andre Nazarov that's waiting for you with the weight vest. And <laughs> we had to do uh, every day off with him. We had to do, you get a day off on the Monday, on the Tuesday morning after practice, you had to get on the ice. Obviously it was a full practice. It's a flow and go. But at the end, that was the understanding that you had to do 10 laps twice under three minutes. And I mean, you're booking it. So that's 18 seconds a lap and guys would do basically 256, 257, but you're flying. So that was his thing. He's like, I'll give you a day off, but that's, that was his mentality is you get to work after, but. I'd rather not have the day off. Yeah, same. Exactly. Exactly. Or we'd run stairs for 45 minutes. Uh, And I mean, in those stadiums, you know, it's NHL arenas. Um, you're just gas. So like you said, you might as well just play two touch or have a light workout instead of a day off. So we had, um, we had Stapleton on, he talked about the story when he came back and there was other people in his apartment. Uh, what are, what are like the jaw dropping moments of your experiences in Russia? Like what were like the, like, this is fucking, this is a different planet. Yeah. I think for me, it was my first stint in the Russian super league was, it was in Mitishi, which was uh, in the Northwest part of, of Moscow, like an industrial part. And they, that was the last year of the Russian super league. It wasn't the KHL yet. So um, it was all cash. So you'd sign a contract, it'd send you money up front. Um, but just getting there, uh, they just basically toss you in and, tell you show up at the rink but i had moziakin who's the legend in, in the khl as as on that team and he spoke english but that guy if if you don't drink 12 coronas at lunch you're not part of his crew so i mean you had to go hard and you had to follow him but he's a star he's a leader and you know if you can't handle five six beers you're in big trouble but for me it was <laughs> you bring everything you bring all your sticks i think i showed up with like 48 sticks you know all the equipment's there but um, you go to the office and they have just a big money counter just for the cash, kind of like what you see in movies. And uh, you give your receipt. And I, I, I had so much cash as far as, uh, you know, money back for my receipts. Um, I got to my apartment and I'm like, where am I putting that? And during that, they wouldn't help you with banks and stuff. And I had, you know, rubber bands of cash and that I ended up leaving after three months I ended up, you know, hiding in my dirty laundry, in my, in my skates, you know, I had my wet equipment and I'm like, if they find the money at customs on my way back, keep it. You know, if you want to go through my dirty laundry, by all means, but I think that was, um, you snuck it all through. You got through it all of it. I got, yeah, I got all through, but that was pretty, uh, now I look back, it's probably not the right thing to do, to be honest. (laughs) But back then you just, you know, you're a young guy, you get exposed to a lot of money and cash and then. You know, everything happens in the blink of an eye. And um, yeah, so to me, that was a big, big eye opener. How much was it cash you came back with? 300? It was in the, yeah, it was in the six digits for sure. Oh Easily up there. Um, so I you, so you didn't sleep trouble. a wink on that flight home? Zero. Zero. Just you overthink yourself and you overthink and overthink and... I got to the point where if I get caught, I get caught. And sure it's like enough, Wolf of Wall Street. What's her Margot Robbie? She's got all the- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Diamonds in here. Yeah. Memes is going to work now. Yeah. But this is 2007. And I mean, I'm sure the, you know, the scanners and stuff have been all updated, but they were in my insoles and my skates. And, you know, if they catch it, they catch it. What was, uh, who was the one kid who was like uh, military affiliated? I, I forget what team it was where he would just go out there and he would fight every fucking guy on the ice. Yeah. So that was, uh, that was with Nazarov in Kazakhstan. So he was 18 years old. His name was uh, last name was Spirev. He was 18 years old and that was uh, Nazarov's boy. So this kid, when we were doing those 10 laps, he was at least two laps behind everybody. The nicest guy, the biggest teddy bear, uh, but could not play a lick of hockey. But his grandpa was one of the old retired general of the army of Kazakhstan. And he ended up taking, switching from his family name, from his dad to his mom's name. Cause obviously that was her father. Um, so with that name, and I mean, me and Nigel Dawes had been pulled over at a stop sign. He ended up being behind us without us knowing he gets out of the car, you know, cops are just freaking out, but he ends up showing his ID or saying who he is and off you go kind of thing. Right. 
Um, but he would be, so especially in Astana, when across the bench, you'd see over the penalty box in the first uh, concourse where obviously where the suites are, if you'd see like 10 guys in suits, that means the whole brass is there. You know, you get the, the mayor of this or the owner of this. So then he would send Riz on the ice and he fought as an 18, he fought, he fought Zvitov, I mean, toe to toe and these, and he did really, really well, but they wanted not like when, you know, Hennessy came in on your podcast as far as like um, in, uh, in the team he played, right. In Vichaz, but in Padulce, but it was, you know, it was almost that, but that's Nazarov and he wanted skilled with that top line and that kid. And that's uh, there's that clip on YouTube where, that was the summer or the exhibition games before I got there where he just manhandled five guys on the ice and jumped on their bench, uh, you know, just did a thing. But that was that. He got and the then snipers after out practice, in case yeah, anyone comes off the uh, bench. And then after practice, he would go train with the Marines and minus 40 outside. And I don't know what he did, but um, it's a great guy. But it was just the culture. That's That's how it was. And if Naz said – you're going if if Nigel Dawes is sitting on the bench because Riz needs to go on the ice and fight Vitov, he's gone. I mean, you got nothing to say, and he would. He get on the bench, sit in the box, and then come right back on the on the bench. Vitov was he was he the guy drafted fourth overall to the Ducks? He was, I think, in Tampa, maybe. Oh, he maybe Tampa. Tampa picked. He spit on someone at the World he Juniors. Is, I remember. Oh, Jesus. Okay. He was an absolute monster. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the kid. Bye. Thanks so much for joining us, man. You've had an unreal career, 17 seasons all over the world. Yeah, I'm congrats, over, man. I don't, I don't know what's up Thank next you for you, media, coach, in front office, but we'll, we'll definitely be keeping an eye on you and hopefully have you back at some point to talk about it. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. Over uh, a 1,000 pro games. Thank you, Marty. Congratulations on a wonderful career, too. And it's a Thanks, lot guys. tougher. It's a lot tougher when you're grinding it in 40 different leagues, too, Biz, than just yeah. doing it in the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Hey, have a great one. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Big thanks to Marty St. Pierre for joining us. Great interview, man. I, I love those guys who traveled all over the world to, to chase their dream and keep playing pro hockey, man. It's some inspiring stuff. So hopefully you enjoyed that. But I do want to tell the fellas listening, Sport Clips Haircuts offers a unique experience that exceeds the typical haircut from start to finish. Sport Clips stylists are experts in men and boys haircuts with specialized training and techniques. Cutting guys' hair can be harder than women's hair, believe it or not. But when you go to Sport Clips versus a place that cuts women's hair, you're getting stylists who are specifically trained to cut guys' hair. Sport Clips are experts in understanding facial shape and hair texture and cutting to a guy's best advantage. Sport Clips' signature service is the MVP haircut experience. It's so much more than a haircut. You got the legendary hot steam towel on your face. Oh, it feels so good. You get the massaging shampoo that makes you melt into your seat. It's the ultimate in relaxation. And with 1,800 locations nationwide, a Sport Clips is closer than you think. Visit a Sport Clips near you for a haircut that exceeds the typical experience from start to finish. But guys, if you're looking to get that wig chop, go to Sport Clips. There's tons of them all over the place. All right, boys, moving along to some hockey news here. A uh, couple of Bum notes we're going to share. The Memorial Cup is officially canceled. I don't think this is too big of a surprise given what the state of junior hockey has been in Canada with the COVID situation. So uh, there will be no Memorial Cup this year once again. Can can somebody, sorry to interrupt you, can can, can, Biz, do you know, like, why doesn't Canada have vaccines? Um, I don't think it's some, I, I don't Do you know. Not, if you don't know, whatever, I'm just, it's like crazy to me. Yeah. It's been a very slow rollout. I think it's been very frustrating for who's Canadians. getting blamed for that. up there? And now word from my sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> Is that not, should we not bring no, this up? No, I'm, I'm just, fucking, no, I'm no, making fun that of the fact. Funny. We, that, that was yeah. funny. That was funny. <laughs> um, it's, I, I don't know what the reason for it is. Obviously. Have your parents been vaccinated? Uh, I think my my parents have gotten their first one. Uh, they haven't gotten the second one yet. I believe the first one gets you like 85% immunity. So I think there's just overall been a lot of frustration on the Canadian side with the way that the government and leadership has handled things. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to leave it at that. I don't really, when, when the, at the beginning of COVID, I, I 
I was really involved in it and was trying to follow up on, on everything online. And it really just put me in a very fucking negative place. So I try to literally know nothing about it other than just stay in my own fucking life. Attaboy. I'll take over then for you in sticking up for <laughs> everyone from Ontario when they shut the golf courses. It's an absolute joke. And I said this back when Massachusetts, you couldn't golf and every other state you could. Now every province can, go- can golf. And these poor guys and women in Ontario that just want to be outside, the safest place you can be you can't play golf get out of here with that ontario enough open the golf courses up let people go outside and enjoy themselves and be healthy and be socially distanced while getting a little exercise and some mental clarity enough is enough ontario go back look at saskatchewan the boys the 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 down to earth no no bullshit they're playing golf you know, anybody listening, I lie on the side of, you know, I, I would, I would like things to be opened up a little bit more. And I, and I, and I'm really, really sympathizing for people ha- who are having to live under the conditions that they are in Canada, specifically um, Ontario. I think BC is pretty strict as well. And, you know, I, I, I you know, I try to not to be too vocal about it with just cause like people get so riled up and, you know, lives, it's just, it's just a fucking brutal situation right now. But yeah, and it's kind of ironic too that British Columbia was so strict at the beginning. Remember, they they almost couldn't get the NHL going because they were so stringent about their guidelines. And then it turns out Vancouver ends up having the worst COVID issues out of anybody. Not yeah. implying anything. It was just kind of a, a coincidence that that's the way it right. played out. Yeah, it's it's been terrible. It's been terrible. I've talked to a lot of friends up there who aren't happy, and uh, and I hope that things open up very very soon for them. Yeah, I think if people take precautions and. We should be able to do adult things. But anyways, let's move along. I did mention the Memorial Cup was canceled, unfortunately. And we got some sad news here in Boston. Uh, Johnny Pearson died at age 95. Played 545 games in the NHL, but more more known to uh, Boston and New England. He called Bruins games for about 18 years. He was uh, basically an icon, him and uh, Fred Cusick. I mean, they were part of my childhood, part of a lot of people's childhood here in Boston who became Bruins fans. So our, our sympathies to the friends and family and, of course, the Bruins alumni who knew Johnny Pearson, uh, a, a legend in a, a, certainly NHL broadcasting here in the New England area. So we were sad to hear that news. Um, today, Whit and Monday in Boston is Marathon Monday. Of course, there's no marathon given the COVID. But Whit, I want to ask, did you venture into the city at all during the marathon to go do some public drinking with the city kids at all? Um, no, I, but I, when I went to BU marathon Monday, and this is for everyone Northeastern BC, it is the day I remember we'd be, we always had to have a, a 6 a.m. workout because they knew we were going so hard that day, you know, so you have to go in, you get your hour long sweat and the boys don't care. You're all together. And then you're, you've already got your beers the night before, and then you just go and you get after it. We used to drink right in front of, um, copy cop. Oh no, you weren't BU. Was it was was, it, was the bar near Kenmore Square called Antuanua? No, what am I thinking? <sighs> oh, uh, Tananog. No, no. Either way, it was right in BU's campus, and the race would run through. I remember my sophomore year. My dad came in. My brother was there. Everyone was getting buckled. The whole team and Will Ferrell ran by. The place went bananas. He was doing the marathon that year, but we would be waffled. <laughs> One year, the so- the Sox always play like a ten thirty start. They played yep. the Yankees. I went with Freddie Meyer. Great buddy of mine. We got to get him on the show, actually. NHL career. He's now running the skills, running teams. His son's nasty. Freddie Meyer, shout out Sanbornville, New Hampshire. And Brian Collins, we went to the game. Played with Bry Guy. Big ears bigger than me, uh, but another Oof. good buddy. Came out of the Red Sox game with those crack beers crippled, and it was like 1.30. And then you just meet the boys on the street. And then you go home, and then let's, you know, maybe people nap. Maybe people get into some shenanigans. And then you see who makes it out that night. You see who makes it out that night. So it was just the longest drinking day of the year. And every school has different traditions in the Boston area. But today was, did you bring up the weather? It was like 61 and sunny. It was the perfect day. It would have been an awesome, awesome time. But no, when I was younger, I didn't no oh, nose bull vodka no <laughs> ncaa buddy I hey was so uh i think we've talked about these crack beers before you think the draft beer that they they uh they give out at fenway has crack in it i think for the most part you'll talk to anyone at stadiums the the draft beer there i don't know if they don't clean the pipes or what it is but fenway park if you have six draft beers you're crippled i don't care how much you can drink you are buzzing 
after six of those. Yeah, especially at an 11 o'clock game at Fenway. And that is, I mean, obviously today, like I said, no marathon, but it's such a great tradition here in Massachusetts. What, uh, what, what the hell is the hell? What's the holiday again? Um, Patriot Day, Patriot's right? Day, yeah. Yeah, they have the, the Red Sox play at 11 in the morning. The marathon goes on. If you cut, leave the game, the marathon's running by. It's just one of those like quintessential Boston days. But I remember back in 05, it was the lockout. Bruins weren't playing. Patrice Bergeron had already played for the Bruins, but they sent him, sent him to Providence because he was young enough to play. While she brought him to the copy cop, there used to be a copy cop on Boylston Street about a mile before the finish line. And it was all kids from South East, Dorchester, and Charlestown just public drinking outside, you know, tucking beers, pissing the alley, do whatever. And while she shows up with Patrice Bergeron, now he was, you know, no people knew who he was, but he wasn't quite the superstar. And I was absolutely buckled, like, like meeting him. I was like, dude, I'm like, and Thornton was still on the team. I was like, you got to show Thornton. I was pointing. I'm like, you got to show Thornton how to win, baby. I goes, you got to oh show him. He's looking goodness. at me like I got No wonder he won't come on the pod. Dude, he's like, that guy's <laughs> on that show? You're like, hey, let me show you this picture of my pet uh, squirrel. Bar- absolutely buckled telling Bergeron to lead the way with Thornton. But, hey, you know what? I, I think I was right at the, at the end of the day. Like, Bergeron had to lead Joe, and they ended up trading him. And, uh, you know. History played out the way it did. R.A. Right? R.A. was the reason Joe Thornton got traded. <laughs> it all comes back to R.A. being no. It's the reason they won the cup. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. They made R.A. The, won the where it all cup started. That, they made the they made the cap room for uh, Ber, uh what's his name, Sharon Savad. <laughs> <laughs> all right, enough of that. Saturday night. Grinelli texted us said, "Who you guys betting the and was it Jake Paul or Logan Paul? I don't know the fucking difference, Grinelli. Jake Paul. Fuck, hey, I've had enough of this shit. I think this is the biggest joke going. Do you see the guy? The guy he fought. Oh, he dude, looked like me. Dude, I got home and I got. I just got the fight because it was. I went out to dinner. I was just sitting there, and I he he walked out and I was like, "Are you serious? It's I actually joke. like was like, what? I texted Grinelli. I go, look at this guy." He literally looked like, yeah, like me or R.A., just a bag of milk. It was disgusting. And then I found out he wasn't even a boxer. So, like, all I, I who am I to say anything to the just Jake Paul kid? God knows how much money he just made. But just fight a boxer. Just fight. A, you're a professional boxer. You're undefeated. Just fight a boxer. Like, you say, and he's open, like, everyone dogs on me. Everyone wants me to lose. Everyone shits on me and says whoever I fight isn't good enough. All right, next fight. Fight a pro boxer, and even if you lose, people will be like, "Yeah, but man, like he's a he fought somebody legit. Like, what does yeah. he care? Because he's making bank." But once they're I running saw a, that, they're guy, running a racket at this point. Yeah, it was a joke. It was a joke. That guy was disgusting. If you if you if you buy those fights, you're an absolute clown. Put the and that clown guy would nose punch our it. heads in, but still, he's not even a boxer. Well, he's but a the UFC fact he, fighter. He, he punched your head, and you wouldn't I mean, he, fucking punch my head in. That guy wasn't... would beat the absolute wheels off you. But Paul? he wasn't you think an MMA no, fighter. No, no, the the UFC fighter. Uh, yeah, but the thing is, what he was an MMA fighter. The clip was going around of him eating punches during a fight, and it's like I understand one punch can knock a guy out from anybody, but it was like he got up, he was laughing after with the wife and walking off. It was almost like Jose Canseco at Rough and Rowdy. Like, they yeah. called it too quick. They called it way he, too quickly. How much did he make? For that fight, Mikey, the the ask group. Or it, it, it's not public, but they sold over. It was like one point four million pay per views. That's insane. I, I, I mean, it was a 50, over fifty dollar fight. They brought in like sixty something million dollars. I, so he I probably say, made a good good ten million or something. Man. Yeah, I mean, maybe that twenty. Paul, that Paul kid, man. I mean, I don't know him. I'm I'm not familiar with his material as you, but like snake it till you make it, dude. If you if you're oh, playing yeah, this yeah. role as a boxer and getting people to fight you and selling this many PPVs, then. Yeah, hey, know, keep doing it, buddy. If people, well, I mean, we, hey, we're that. convincing people we know something about hockey. I mean, I'm sure you can convince enough people that he's a fighter. So, fuck, <laughs> yeah. I guess we'll, well, just secure, secure the bag and move speak on. For right? your, yeah. Speak for yourself. See, <laughs> speaking of securing the bag, Mikey Grinelli, let's talk about the sonk. Fill us in. RA, that is correct. We have another sonk. Every Tuesday and Friday, we have the sonk on the Play Barstool app. And this time, it's at $7,500. Like I told you guys last week, $2,500. It carries over week by week. If someone doesn't win and no one's won, you have to get all six picks right. That's the point of the game. You have to get all six picks right. This week, here are the questions. Okay. Um, Johnny Goudreau, yes or no? Will he score? I chose yes. Uh, Calgary versus Ottawa. You have to pick the score of that game. I, I chose four. Calgary four, Ottawa three. Uh, Connor McDavid to score. I chose yes. Then you have to choose the score of Edmonton, Montreal. I chose Edmonton four, Montreal one. Then it's James Ream, James Van Riemsdyk. Will he score? Yes or no? I chose yes. And then you have to pick the score of the Rangers, Philadelphia Flyers game, in which I chose the Rangers five, Philadelphia Flyers two. As everyone's listening to that, yes, it, it's 
it's very hard, but it's free. That's the whole point. So get on there. And what, what do you have to lose? It takes you legitimately four seconds to just chuck out some guesses. And then if it's your lucky night, you're $7,500 richer. So check out the song. So having said all that, go to play bar stool, get involved in the song. And you never know what can happen on one night when you catch fire and become a rich man. So uh, what else did we have boys to chat about? Oh, there was a golf tournament. And when I speak about golf, I got to bring up our, our good friends at TaylorMade. They have a new website that you guys all need to check out immediately. It's barstoolsports.com slash TaylorMade. So I guess it's part of Barstool's page, but they have their own area where you can see everything for sale involving Barstool, Spit and Chicklets, and TaylorMade. You've heard us talk all about them. The Sim family is out. They're available now. You can get, get fitted anywhere with the woods, the hybrids, the irons. They are so good. You hit them pure. You hit them very, very far. And if you go to barstoolsports.com slash TaylorMade to check out right now, the latest videos from our entire team at Chicklets and the golf team over at Foreplay. And the tour response also is the ball that many people have wondered what a, what a nice expensive ball, like, like what is, what's the difference, right? Well, you're going to get the, the nice expensive ball without the expensive part because it's a great ball. It's cheaper than the competitors and you can get that at the Barstool Sport store excuse me so what are you waiting for get yourself fit for the new sim family of clubs and get out there at barstoolsports.com slash tailormade and we bring up golf because this week hilton head the rbc heritage classic is i believe what the tournament's called and stewart sink 47 years old wire to wire dusting of a pretty strong field post week after augusta and wins for the second time this year. He won the Safeway in the fall, or whenever that was, and he goes on to shoot 63 in the first round. I bet against him in the second round because a guy who's older and you shoot 63, it's hard to back that up. Guy shoots 63, it's hard to go out there and fire a low number after that. He did it again. He had a 63 again. He was 16 under through, through Friday. It, and, and for people, I haven't played this course, but in reading about it and talking to people and watching it and talking to people who've played there, bowling alley biz we would be screwed or i would be screwed you'd be just completely screwed you have to hit the ball so straight the fairways are so tight and the greens are so small that this guy just put on a clinic with his son on on the bag his son's his caddy i think his son's the same age as colin morikawa who's in the final group with them sunday so an amazing feat for a guy to go wire to wire at that age. And then and, and you talk after the families were talking uh, or his family was talking. He's just had a resurgence at a later age. That's why golf's nuts. You can play the best golf in your, in your life when you're 50 years old. That's what I keep telling myself. So to see that was pretty cool. And, and a guy who won the British Open, people actually probably the most um, disliked isn't the correct word. But when he won the Open, it was the year Tom Watson blew it. Tom Watson was like 74 years old, like leading the British Open. All he had to do was par the last hole, the 72nd hole at Turnberry. And he hit his drive in the middle of the fairway. And then he hit a little too much club and the ball bounced long. He still made a pretty good putt from off the green and missed like a five-footer to win the oh. Open. It sent him to a playoff with Stuart Sink, who took it down in the ugliest fluorescent green hat or like <sighs> shoes I've ever seen. So everyone wanted Tom Watson to break this record of the oldest major winner ever, and then Stuart Sink in his, in his horrible lid is taking it away. So he's still an Open champion, but I remember most people wanted Watson to get it done. But congrats to him. It was a huge weekend uh, win. How, how old is the oldest guy now? In his 70s? Uh, Oh, uh, no, I think the oldest major winner is uh, 47 or 48 years old. Like this guy, like Julian Soros. Am I imagining that name? Oh, my goodness. So th- no one even in their 50s or 60s. No, no one's ever won. This a guy could have won a major at 74. It's That's not never ju- that would have never been Soros. broken. <laughs> it's not Julian. I just Googled Julian Soros. Some guy from Yale School of Engineering pops but, up. Wait, I think it's Julie, <laughs> Julius Boros. Is yeah, is. pretty, pretty. Wow. 48 wait, what, years, four months. What have I been saying wait, for the last few months on this podcast regarding I know. golf gambling? That eventually a bomb is going to come in. Now, Stuart Sink, you could have got him before pre tournament odds anywhere from 100 to 1 to 175 to 1. Absolutely ridiculous odds he came in. And then this stat, unfortunately, it wasn't brought to my attention until after the tournament, but there was a tweet on April 13th before the tourney. Uh, in, in the, this was from a guy, Dave Tyndall, Dave Tyndall, at Dave Tyndall Golf. 
He said, in the debate on whether to back someone if they've done well at the Masters, there's a player at the Heritage whose first five wins came the week after a major, including two at the IBC. And, of course, that was Stuart Sink. He had he week after the Masters, the guy who was on fire. I wish I saw this tweet fucking three days before. I would have made a shitload of money. But bottom line is, after Masters, this guy is, is, is a fucking machine. He's won six did fucking you, tournaments. Did you say his first five wins on tour came the week after the Masters? Or, or a major, excuse me. His first five wins came the week after a major. A major. two at the IBC because he had won it twice prior. So basically, but you he also, had, you also did say that it was a strong field, though, right, Whit? It was a pretty strong field. Like, DJ's playing. I mean, all the guys who are RBC sponsors are obviously there, but... I mean, Morikawa was there. Is he an RPC guy? I, I don't know. But the, the the picture that blew me away was he won this exact tournament. It must have been 20 years ago. You should see his outfit. And his, his caddy was, like, being held in his arms by his mom. He's a little baby or two years old, whatever it is. So, like an acid-washed fucking jeans on? <laughs> no, the guy had on, like, the loosest fit pleated khakis with a garbage visor on, just, a eight, just like a 90s style to the core. But... Pants Man, that's Jordan, that's Jordan longevity. That's longevity. Yeah. Hey, I, God bless anybody who had him at those odds too. Um, the, the other sport what we talk about oh in addition to God, golf, I know what you're going to say. Soccer, man, it's it, it feels like a, an earthquake throughout the soccer world. Obviously, you know, soccer not huge in America, but there are tons of uh, European soccer fans in America, and a bunch of teams are forming a super league. Uh, it's kind of a weird thing. You know, if you're not familiar with European soccer, and I'm hardly a, a master of that stuff, but a bunch of teams from different countries are going to form their own league and be a super league and kind of upset the whole um, fucking, I guess, world of uh, European soccer. I know some politicians some, uh, have come out and spoken against it. I don't know if it's going to happen, but let's go to you, Wit, for your reaction. Disgusted. <laughs> New <Biz>. soccer guy. <laughs> Disgusting. As a lifelong soccer fan and Chelsea football club fan and my club being part of this, disgusted. Big Cat had on troops on part of my take that dropped today. This is we're you know, we're we're doing this Monday, and he does a great job of explaining why it is so disgusting. And he's a man, he's an Arsenal man. Ugh, terrible team. He's an Arsenal man, and they're part of it too. They're part of the Super League. I don't know how they're part of the Super League. Them and Tottenham suck, but they're richer clubs. Now, here's basically what happened, and Big Cat had a pretty good analogy, I thought. If anyone doesn't know, European soccer is made up of, you know, the French League, uh, La, La Liga in, in Italy. Um, Bundesliga. Bundesliga in Germany. The English Premier League. What's Syria. the French? What's the French? Uh, Ita- Italy, Syria, Syria, Italy. Italy. Syria. What is, what is um, Syria. French's league? Come on, R.A. Trivia. Um, Trivia. I think this might come up. Oh. La, is La Liga croissant, Spain or, the or France? I think that's Spain. The croissant, chocolate the croissants. Croissant. Ryder's favorite breakfast. It's a healthy breakfast, Dad. So all these leagues have their regular seasons, and the Premier League is the best league in the world, I would say. And there's oh, a lot of money involved. Le- league with L-I-G-U-E. League. 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 Um, now, Mikey, if you could do me a favor while I'm talking, is pull up the list of the teams. But basically the, what it comes down to is – there's a lot of teams in each league who are the big dogs and you see it over here with the Yankees and the Red Sox. And you look at the big market teams and the big spenders and English football, it's Manchester United, Arsenal, Chelsea, Tottenham, Man City. And I'm forgetting one. Damn. They're like the six power teams and they are the richest clubs, but they're also the ones generating most of the money. And so they look at it with some of their greedy American owners who uh, troops does a great job of just carving. And these guys looking at like, why are we making money for all these lower level teams? Let's start our own super league. Well, the issue is the history of soccer and the, the, the fact that there is so many different tournaments in Europe. Each European league has their, has their league tournament or their league regular season. Then there is the, the Champions League, where England sends their top four teams in the Champions League. Germany sends teams. For every, every league in Europe sends teams. And then you play for, to become the champions of Europe. And there's even for teams who get knocked out and other teams, they play in another tournament like that, just beneath it, beneath it good speaking, called the Europa League or the Europa Cup. What, what they're trying to create is never any matchups against lower level teams, which is what's made soccer in, in, in all of these countries become such a, a world presence. 
since history, since the, the game began. So if you look at like what the coolest thing in, in England and Russia with hockey, the same thing they do it where the, these teams are, like I said, are eight and under they begin. All these teams are like, man, you played, you played for a team your entire life and a team who doesn't have money, they still have a chance. They, they, it's going to be difficult and you can't face off against Man City if you're a Swansea or some lower level Fulham team, but you have the chance and there's relegation and it's just such a long history of like, you can't ruin that and change that and create the Premier League not meaning anything and the, the Champions League not meaning anything because these teams who are just going to play each other every year have taken and are trying to get rid of like the history of soccer. So I don't even know if I'm doing a good job explaining it, but I for got the, the most... teams here, Wade, if you want. Them. Okay, so go ahead, read the teams. There's also no relegation in the Super League, too. Which exactly, it's just well. it's 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 ruining like what what's what soccer is. There's already it's, a Champions League. It's Milan, Arsenal, Atletico Madrid, Chelsea, Barcelona, Inter Milan, Juventus, Liverpool, Man City, Man United, Real Madrid, and Tottenham. Yeah. Okay. I bet you the players are like fucking right. So if that's where we're no, traveling to, let's no, roll, baby. No, because all players don't like because it. FIFA's already come out. That's why I, I don't think this is going to happen. And if it does, it's actually like the end of soccer. And I just became a fan. And the fact that this may happen pisses me off. FIFA has come out and said if you You're play for if you play true the true mush if you play for a team in the Super League, you cannot play for your country in the World Cup. Wow, that's a heavy that's a heavy punishment. Now. On the and other that's side all that of it, matters to them. On the other side of it, and they're doing this at the perfect time, right? Where it's COVID, there's no fans at the games, Troops brings this up. And the fact that each team, in losing all this money over the past year, each team, if they join the Super League, is going to be given $3 billion. So it'll change soccer forever. But if you're telling me that, that 12 of the best or whatever the teams, the best teams in the world, all those players can't play World Cup. What is going to be, what will soccer be? Bring them to America, baby. Bring them all over here. Let's get MLS. Going. MLS. What's it called? The, is that the yeah, word? MLS? MLS, yeah. MLS baby. So old That's... guys come to get fat paychecks and retire. <laughs> Seriously. Beckham it's like, comes to just the, live the, in Miami MLS is it like, is, it's like a, a old, old like pro league. I'm trying to think of like an NHL equivalent where guys just like play out the fucking string and get and where Yager owns his team and plays yeah. in the league. Well, also, so if, if you look at college football, this was what the big cat analogy was college football. If Alabama LSU, um, Oh, what a take that is, you know, you know what I mean, right? You're, oh. And, 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 and Ohio state and Texas and Oklahoma and the best teams in the pac 12 just start a league. I'd love like, it. I don't know. Would you? Oh, I went I'd to. Love it. I went to. What? I actually went to uh, LSU, Good Alabama, college football at LSU. Oh, really? What a that fucking would be sick! Get what a time value. that is, dude. Three times as many people tailgating as there are in the game. Any, any, for any reason, for me not to have to watch these homecoming games where teams are getting bent over sixty to nothing. <laughs> yes, know, make the make boring. the college super argument. league, please. So, so Biz, he, are you a fan of the Super League? I don't want to see Nick Saban fucking dummy and teams one thousand to nothing on on homecoming night. <laughs> no, Alabama's ball boy could be well, like the starting QB on like the lowest level team they play against. But I think another fact the two is from boy. when I've gathered reading, I read I read Jack Mack on on Boston and Sam Zami, who's been doing tremendous soccer work for years there, and obviously Troops has joined us. It's it seems like the. The reason the fans are mad is because, you know, there's so many working class fans of these teams and then they yes. feel like they're being sold up the river by these teams for, for the dollar. And these teams, these these fans speak out more than I think North American fans do. Like North American fans up. Yep. Prices are going up. What are you going to do? Well, European fans, they go protest outside the fucking press car, uh, the, the what do you call it? Box office. And they and they protest the team. and They make these things not happen. Obviously, there's much more passion about soccer in Europe, but. It's a complex issue, but yeah, I'll, I I wouldn't say I'll be surprised if it goes through, but I wouldn't be shocked if it does not go through at all. Given soccer given fans the do the the Clark Griswold's uh, brother-in-law approach, where they go kidnap the boss. <laughs> I don't know. Why Shitters I full. I don't Shitters know why they call the stuff hamburger help a car does just fine by itself. <laughs> <laughs> Cousin Eddie, all timer. Uh, um, boys, I actually our buddy Mike Camito. We've talked about him on the show before. He has the book. Uh, Hockey 365. He's a, he has a new version of it coming out. If you haven't checked it out, every day he has a, a different story from hockey. He's got a fantastic Twitter feed. Uh, check that stuff out as well. He's a great follow. Uh, and boys, did you see Glenny Balls' adventure down in Georgia? Uh, co- uh, co-work Glenny Balls. No. 
Dude, Glenny Balls, uh, if you're not familiar with him, he does burger reviews at Barstool. He's a, just a Balls. jolly kid. He's such a nice kid. And he was down in Georgia uh, for Riggs's, uh, well, Barstool's golf classic. And somebody actually invited him to their wedding. They're like, hey, if you're in Georgia, why don't you come to a wedding? Glenny is 24 years old, and he's never been to a wedding before. So he went to his very first wedding. He was in Atlanta for the Barstool classic. He, get, he ended up going to... Total stranger's wedding. He knew nobody there. He went to the wedding, blogged about it. And again, Glenny's such a nice, jolly kid. He went, had a great time, was dancing with grandmothers and aunts and shit. It's all in Instagram. Crushed every bridesmaid. Uh, it, it was absolutely <laughs> four hilarious. Four for four, first wedding. I, it was hey, a cash bar, though. Cash I hadn't bar. been to a wedding at 24. Really? Yeah. I don't know. Like, none of my buddies were married. My first wedding was... Well, that I visited, not fact. Or, you know, I might have gone to one when I was real young, right? But I don't remember it. But actually, I went to, well, this is going to sound weird. My mother's wedding, she, my, she divorced my father when I was a baby and got remarried. I was actually the first wedding I went to. I was like nine years old, 10 years old, and my mother and my stepfather's wedding. And it was the first time I ever Were you did like, like the ring bear or anything. Uh, no, uh, we, did, I don't know if uh, my mother did a ring bear, no. but we were there. Obviously, we were, we were the it's kids. Too much. Uh... Too much to ask for for yeah. at that age. Yeah, but no, dude, dude it, in. It, it was Weird. awesome, dude. It was the first time I, I was ever at a, at a at a party with adults. Like, I mean, I was at you know in the seventies and eighties, you were around adults a lot, and you saw stuff maybe you wouldn't see nowadays. But this was unreal, dude. It was the first time I got on a dance floor and danced. I never danced before, and it was like, holy shit, this is like you know, it's still a, a very vivid memory. Fucking 30, 40 years later, that you know, you're out there dancing with adults, having a good time, but. Yeah, they're dude, like, I hey, are you the nine-year-old with the coke? And it's like, yeah, yeah, let's <laughs> yeah. go. Let's Who's holding? Them. I'm like, this kid's off the wall. Yeah, I'm like, this nine-year-old's got the shit. <laughs> no, but I, I was fucking, I was revving. Hey, was I, I dr- was I dreaming that last night, or did that nine-year-old really have a bag of blow at the fucking wedding? <laughs> Kept the whole party going. <laughs> But no, I'm surprised. Oh yeah, dude, you should have seen the you should have seen the Playboy subscription that he brought too. (laughs) They were the party party favors, fucking 1980 issue of Playboy. Oh my god, (laughs) I'm surprised it was that late for your wedding because you know I I think most people are at weddings by drinking age, uh, 18. You might have a cousin or a friend. Maybe I was 23. Uh, I don't know. Weddings are fun, but what happens is like. You go through so much of a glut of them in your 20s into your 30s that they become redundant, which sucks because you should want to be there and experience it. Like it's a first time event, but everybody gets married within the first fucking, not for more than like five, 10 years. And it's just like before you know it, you're like, oh, fuck, we got to go to another fucking It's the domino effect. It's like once one person in the friends group gets uh, married, it's this big domino effect. But I mean, so I agree with you, RA, less people should get married. Yeah, well, just spread it out (laughs) a little more, you know? (laughs) No, weddings well, are no, fucking like, fun. Get married, get married. You, I saw her. Uh, Trevor uh, Lawrence has got married. That's yeah, got- that's wild. Be love. That's Gotta that's love. wild. First overall. Let me let me trans let me translate for everybody listening. Married. I can't believe this guy got married at a college because he's going to sign this massive NHL, NFL ticket, and he could be hammering chicks like Nick Boza is on his Instagram. Prenup. Correct? Prenup. Is that kind of the is that kind of the breakdown? Wit is that fair? Yeah, but listen, people are different, and I think it sounds like he's maybe you know a, a very solid fundamentals. No, yeah, that's normal. a football term. Maybe normal. like a, yeah, just a guy who's in love at a very young age. But yeah, normal. Listen. Let's, yeah. Good luck. Yeah. I, I sound like an asshole. It's just like no, I don't know. It's a, it's a young. If my son was the, oh, about to be the first overall pick in the NFL draft, <laughs> and he got married. I'd be like storming the gates to break it up. Biz, you would go to a, str- a wedding with as a stranger. I could see maybe not right now, but I could totally see that at twenty four. Like some fan invites you, to, like in Erie, Pennsylvania, come to our wedding. You're in town for the weekend. I've crush ne- four sixes. I, I've showed up to places like like a hotels and and there was uh, you know a couple people in the lobby from from a, a wedding where they were like hey come and say hi like my friend and then I, I went in there for like a drink like joined in on on a, on a wedding but never like for the whole goddamn thing. I I actually had a very briefly a wedding crash at my wedding when I was I got married in Florida. I did the destination wedding. Which I, I know Stanley it's Cup crashed yours. The guy who carries it around with the white yeah, glove, Richard Pryor. It was that, yeah. And I got <laughs> married Le- Lido Beach Resort in Florida, just the the island just north the Siesta Key, beautiful spot. And I was sitting there, I looked over, and like, yeah, when you when you spend that kind of money in your fucking wedding, you you know who on, who was on the list. And I looked over, and I'm like, 
yeah, I don't know that guy. And like, I, I just walked over. I didn't grab somebody. Like, hey, who's that guy over there? I was like, hey, buddy, um, who are you here with? And he was like, ah, whatever. I was like, yeah, I don't think that's uh, anybody here. You should probably leave. He left like without incident, but I actually had to boot somebody from my own wedding who was trying to crash it. I already had the uh, hand stamps. He, he was yeah. giving out drink, drink tickets. Yeah. He had full on, <laughs> full on security. Fucking gate bait in the morning, motherfucker. Crashed my wedding. It was probably your buddy's like connect that he had bringing him some <laughs> shit to get... Even no, no, that was Tommy. We way. let him in fine. He didn't have him, but we waved him in right. <laughs> in. Uh, he was actually my team. he was actually my best man. Yeah, he was on the, the the invisible link list we had. Already found a SWAT team on Craigslist in order for, to to play security at his wedding. <laughs> Dude, my wedding was a blast, though. It was fun. We're, we're, I mean, we've kind of went on forever here. Holy shit! Yeah, it, yeah, it's been fun, man. I think I, I texted G and sent out a tweet. I think this has been a fun episode. We go off the rail sometimes. This is one of them, but I think people in the cars driving around, it's, it's a nice distraction for them. I agree. I agree too. All right, boys. Very man, true. Very any final true. note you want to add before we sign off on? Yeah. Wits an asshole. Uh, he doesn't believe in marriage. And if you have any issues with that, please take it up with him on Twitter. <laughs> doesn't imagine not believing in true love biz. What a heartless bastard. <laughs> hey boys. <laughs> what? You can think what you want. But I think with my brain, not always my heart, you got to use both. So you can always say, wit's the prick, wit's an asshole. But I know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> Let me tell you that. Good I luck agree. to the Lawrences, by the way. And well, let's, hope do the, it. let's hope the, uh, the Super League gets axed. By next week's episode, we need no more Super League. That needs to be resolved quickly. Goodbye. Let's do it. All right, everybody. Have an awesome week. We love you. Enjoy. Bye.